I thought what I'd do is just hit uh, some of the higher profile things out of the 2022 report. And then if anybody has any questions um, about 2022, uh, I can certainly respond to those. Or otherwise, if it's a carry forward, uh, you should see them in the 2023 plan and we can spend more time talking about that. So can you bring that up, Danny? Uh, you should have this in your package, but just for the public's uh, convenience, we'll throw this up. So again, uh, we have three documents that we produce out of our strategic planning process. The first is the strategic plan, and uh, this board has adopted the 2023 to 2026 uh, strategic plan. So uh, where you look at your guiding principles for your four-year term. Uh, so we've adopted that. The second report, uh, we drill down, and then uh, the corporate action plan is where we set out our 2023 projects, really, uh, is what we're doing. So in the corporate action plan, you'll see uh, certainly the key success drivers are repeated, and then we have our goals under each key success driver. We have our objectives under each goal. And we have our performance indicators, which is really the actions that we're going to take under each objective. So we'll talk about those uh, when we get into 2023. Um, but as far as uh, 2022, uh, if you, uh, yes? It's forward to each page if you like. Oh, okay. I'll see if I can, All right, what do you got up there? Have you got the... 2022 quarterly report. Yeah. So if you're looking on in your 2022 corporate business plan, uh, you'll see that we usually on a quarterly basis talk about the dashboard and then I'll update on some of the uh, activities we've made progress on. Uh, we use a color code in order to uh, identify how we're doing. If it's green, uh, then we expect to be able to achieve on time and budget. And if it's yellow, it means that there's some sort of an issue, but we still expect to work our way through it. Uh, and if it's red, it just means that we're not going to complete it in that calendar year. So we have a number of red uh, objectives on the 2022 plan that we did not complete. And, and um, those will be carried forward into 2023. But I thought I'd just... Uh, quickly go over some of those. Um, one uh, is the, uh, I, and I don't have anything I'm going to talk about anymore on uh, key success driver number one, which is our high performing uh, organization, or key success uh, driver number two, which is our outwardly focused customer service uh, uh, key success driver. But I do want to have a talk a about a couple of them in key success driver number three, which is that one about uh, sustainable uh, community. Uh, we use those three pillars of community sustainability to uh, put uh, our objectives and our performance indicators under. Uh, so the three pillars are uh, the uh, social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability, and we break out our projects under the one uh, that's most appropriate. So if we look at uh, objective 3.1.1, which is under social sustainability, uh, you'll see that that's red, and uh, for us, that uh, 3.1.1 is our emergency uh, program. And uh, we had some things that we wanted to do in uh, 2022, but uh, we deferred those because we were going to go into our emergency program study that the board identified in that strategic planning workshop in, uh, with Gord McIntosh in November of 2021. Uh, and uh, we wanted to do a complete uh, review of the, of the program and it took us till uh, August of 2022 to get our terms of reference uh, agreed upon. And then we went, uh, we developed the, uh, we went out for uh, proposals and hired a contractor and that study is underway. So that's carried forward into 2023. 
but it's red for 2022 because we didn't complete those activities uh, that we had identified uh, under the emergency program. So, uh, and that's a high profile one for us in 2023. Um, but in the meantime, um, we've got a bunch of stuff pending. Like really our interest in that emergency program review, uh, one of the main interests is site management. It's the boots on the ground concept that we were talking about that flowed, <laughs> sorry, uh, out of the atmospheric river. Uh, in that, uh, when we when we get a fast moving flood, usually with a flood you can predict. You get a notice that you know you're going to get a big rainfall or there's a large snow melt, uh, and you can get ready. Uh, you we didn't have that opportunity with the atmospheric river, so certainly with the semilkamine, it happened quickly and. Uh, it, it was uh, an egregious event. So our problem is uh, we don't have a site management capability for floods. So we had nobody on site. We had nobody that we could send on site. Uh, we eventually got a uh, hydrological engineer up there to sort of look at the river and try and give us an idea of the inundation, uh, especially around Tulamine. Uh, Princeton was doing the same on the Tulamine and Samokamine rivers for Princeton. And then uh, downstream uh, towards Karameas, uh, there we had, uh, we actually had four sites uh, that we had identified in that area of the Samilkamine. Um, but as far as a, a, an on-site presence as to somebody really out there doing work or uh, uh, presenting uh, themselves to citizens, uh, we're, we're in a deficit uh, for that. So definitely that's one of the ones we want to explore in this emergency program study. Um, our regional emergency management program, and we've said this, is strictly on preparedness. We don't have a response capability funded under our regional emergency management program. Uh, we don't have recovery and we don't have mitigation. So where we talk about doing flood mitigation works, and we've talked about this a number of times at budget. Uh, we uh, we don't have enough citizens in our rural areas to contribute the amount of money necessary for flood mitigation. To to build dikes along the Similkameen everywhere uh, that there's a potential of flooding is not feasible with the number of people that we have that would pay into that service. And then always the question is, on a regional emergency management program, do the incorporated communities uh, pay in for capital works that would benefit rural citizens? So we have to explore all of that in our, uh, in our program review. So those were some of the activities that we had identified for 2022 in our uh, corporate business plan. Didn't get them done because we're waiting now uh, on the study. Uh, which is uh, well underway. We're, we're out with our citizen perception survey. We're out uh, now just planning our uh, interagency meetings and our focus group meetings and our citizen engagement meetings where we're actually going into some of these communities uh, to get feedback. Um, the other one was 3.2.2 uh, that um, is sort of of the same nature. When we get into 3.2, this is uh, our uh, economic sustainability. Um, so 3.2.2, this is where we put all of our long range planning documents. We had thought we were going to complete our regional growth strategy review and you changed the scope on us. So uh, we went uh, back out, it required more consultation, it was broader uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the TAC, which is all of the incorporated community planners and our planners, that technical advisory group, they get together because the regional growth strategy affects everybody in the region. Uh, they have identified now the issues and they've done their consultation, I, I believe, uh, very close to coming back uh, to committee uh, with the outcome of that. But it, we didn't get it done in 2022, which we had endeavored uh, to do. So that was red. And then uh, the Area E official community plan, uh, again, lots of issues 
over in area E with regards to the long-term um, policies for area E. So that one's taking a little longer on the consultation side, uh, but should come in very soon as well. But we didn't get that done in 2022 either. So that's why it's red. And then uh, on 3.3.1, which is environmental sustainability, uh, this is where we put our solid waste uh, issues. Uh, and we have one goal for our landfills and then a separate goal for the collection system. All of our activities with regards to solid waste management in 2022 were based on this uh, organic treatment and processing facility at 1313 Greyback Mountain Road, uh, which uh, recently got rejected by the Agricultural Land Commission. So uh, everything is pending. We have master plans on all of our landfills that are halfway through. We have design closure and operations plans on all of our landfills that are halfway through. We need a new access and egress at Campbell Mountain Landfill, which means new scales halfway through because we don't know what's gonna happen uh, with our organics facility. Uh, on the bright side, uh, we almost have an operating certificate on our biosolids uh, project. So uh, where we are, are in contravention of the uh, active gas capture rec regulation uh, since 2016, and we did that pilot project to, instead of putting an active gas capture system in the landfill, to use uh, bio cover as a mitigating circumstance for methane gas, uh, which would be much better uh, so, um, environmentally as well as uh, economically. Uh, it should save us uh, 25 to $30 million. But it's taken like seven years. Uh, first of all, talking to the province and then doing a pilot project four pilot projects on different types of bio cover uh, and the mixture of it and then working through uh, uh, the owner's process of negotiating the conditions uh, that will go on the operating certificate um, but we think uh, we're almost there they uh, usually what happens is uh, the last questions will provide answers they'll come back and ask more questions. I mean, we've done this for like three years, um, but uh, we haven't had any new set of questions now for the, uh, lately. So we think we'll be right into design in 2023, which would be good. Okay, question from Director Conant. Yeah, uh, thank you through the chair. Are you saying that if we have if the bio cover is accepted then and started, then we don't need the composting site, or is that completely separate? No, that's a separate project. Oh, it is. Okay. If we get the bio cover project approved, we don't need the active gas capture system, right? Which means, which would mean digging up Campbell Mountain landfill, putting extraction pipes underneath, and then capturing the methane and flaring it off. Uh, which in our minds would not work. It's not working in Vernon. We aren't producing enough methane. It's all model-based for the province. They have a model, and, be, and if you get so many tones of waste, you're a regulated landfill, and you have to have an active gas capture system. But uh, first of all, we don't believe their model. Uh, but secondly, uh, when we did our testing, there's not enough methane that's going to be captured uh, to uh, ec uh, efficiently flare off. Um, but the bio cover project uh, is going to be beneficial for everybody. There, it's not easy to find a spot for local governments to put their biosolids, first of all. Everybody's trucking it everywhere. Uh, Lower Mainland's trucking it into Alberta. Um, so it's not an easy product, uh, but if you can store it, you can use it as bio cover because then it's... Uh, uh, it's safe. It has like bio solids have pathogens in them. Bio cover uh, when you mix it uh, is safe and it can, it can uh, mitigate the methane that's coming out of landfill. Uh, but anyway, that's going too deep. Oh, just one more question about, um, so are we doing a, is it would be a third application in for that location 
for the composting site? No, you can make one application and you can make one appeal. We're toast. <laughs> so we have to, we're, we're looking at alternatives. Uh, I don't know what they would be. Thanks. Okay, Director so, Gettens, you question? Yes, yeah, so just to follow up, but then I thought we were still waiting to hear back on the appeal, but is that, when did that decision come? Oh, uh, maybe three weeks ago. No. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, what else are they going to say? Yeah. We're, we're working on alternatives. We're going to bring a report in. Yeah. This is just me venting. No sense us coming in and saying, oh, we can't do it. <laughs> we're going to come in and say, here are the alternatives. Yeah. That's what the, the uh, professionals are working on. Just a layman's point of view. <laughs> uh, any questions on the 2022 Q4 report off the business plan? Not seeing any other hands. Okay. Um, all right. So that finishes that item. We'll go to the activity report then. Or is that? Next, CAO? Yes, it is. So, again, this is a carry forward from uh, January 19th. Uh, again, as part of your oversight responsibility, what we'd like to do is bring in a narrative activity reports from each of our departments, and they report out through all five of our select committees. For uh, corporate services, uh, we report out on our support functions. So all of those departments that serve other employees, basically, uh, we call a support department, those that directly serve the customer or line departments. So uh, support functions for us are legislative services, uh, human resources, finance, and information services. Okay? So those are the four that you see in your activity report uh, before you. So this is the end of your report uh, based on what each of those departments did in the fourth quarter of 2022, and then what they've got planned on their work schedule for the first quarter of 2023. And always when we're coming in, uh, we're saying, if there's something on there that you don't think uh, we should be working on, uh, let us know. If there's uh, something that's not there that you were expecting to see, ask, and uh, we can give you an update on it and then make sure we include it in previous years. Uh, at the last meeting, January 19th, you got the report uh, from planning and building enforcement, and you got the report from utilities, and uh, uh, you got the report from protective services and community services. This is just the remaining four uh, that we're talking about today. So uh, I'll just quickly hit some of the high points on this. You can see that for legislative services, uh, Q4 of 2022 was all about the election, just uh, an all-encompassing uh, focus on making sure that the election goes right, and then we start in the orientation process and uh, uh, focusing then on how to get everybody uh, back to business. Right? So that was um, what was going on. Uh, the other thing, uh, for uh, just for information, uh, you just had your workshop with Tracy Lorenzen talking about customer service and uh, where we're moving the organization towards uh, with regards to policy and standardization and checklists and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, we got good information from that. But there was a long lead up uh, before we got to the board. Uh, we, this was a 2022 project that started uh, with uh, Ms. Lorenzen coming in, talking to all the staff, uh, doing that uh, environmental scanning as to what went well, what went wrong. Same thing she did with you. Uh, and they went all through the staff. Uh, uh, every department has different needs. Uh, so we were in there. And then it culminated uh, with uh, the discussion with the board. So yet to come in 2023 is the outcome of that, which is the policy and standards and, and procedures and an ongoing focus on customer service. So that uh, organized by Ms. Malden 
and Ms. Morgan. Uh, so they were very focused on that in addition to the election uh, and then uh, orientation uh, procedure. At, uh, all of these things are over and above the day-to-day -day, uh, activities uh, of a department. These are the project works uh, that we're talking about here. So in uh, first quarter of 2023, uh, just two notables for me, uh, we're gonna continue on with the orientation program. Uh, uh, I, I think everybody enjoys uh, the opportunities for the board to get together with some of the municipal councils or CAOs and have those larger uh, discussions about important issues. We just did the code of conduct one. Um, we have uh, Ellie Mina coming in, in, no, we have Gord McIntosh coming in uh, in a couple of weeks to talk about strategic planning from a bigger perspective. Uh, in March, we have Ellie Mina coming in, talk about parliamentary procedure and uh, all the other stuff that uh, Mr. Mina does. And uh, we'll have Jerry Berry coming in talking about teamwork and uh, a board evaluation. And uh, we're going to, I think we're starting to look at an, uh, organizing an Indigenous relations uh, workshop. Uh, we talked a bit about that when uh, Reese Harding was in. So we want to continue uh, providing those opportunities for the board. So if you have any suggestions on that, by all means, talk to Ms. Malden. We'll get them on the list. Um, and then the other thing is... Question from Mr. Miller, or Director Miller. Bill, I was wondering, or I'm sorry, Mr. CAO, uh, for um, a day of orientation, what does that cost uh, first with the facilitators fees and then when you add everybody else's expenses up on, on average? Give a cost on that. It depends basically about, uh, well, each consultant is different in their costs, but I would say approximately 4000 for a day. That would be for the consultant or with that? That's for everything. Okay. Anything else on that one? Not seeing um, any other hands at the moment. And then the other project uh, is going to alert. So we, we've had indications from members that we need to do some work on that, uh, especially through the emergency program, uh, but also generally uh, as to some of the, we just have to do some tweaking on it. Uh, so that is on uh, legislative services docket for Q1 in 2023, among uh, all the other things that you see there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, information services. If anybody has any questions on that, Danny's in the room. He'd be happy to answer them. Um, but generally, uh, we're moving, uh, like our other members are, we're moving onto the cloud. So this uh, Microsoft 365, all of our stuff is, uh, they're in the process of uh, transitioning that over to the cloud. Uh, we just did get our letter from school district uh, 67 saying they're no longer going to provide phone services for us. Uh, that we have to be off it by June. So uh, uh, information services is working on the transition uh, to bring that in house. Uh, we're working on, uh, he, we're like, yeah, just everything you could imagine. Uh, uh, Danny's got his fingers on right now, um, as well as uh, uh, keeping all of our meeting capabilities are going. So uh, okay, I one of the things see that, a hand quickly from Director Roberts. Go ahead. Thank you. And it's just a quick question because um, a high, fi um, high speed fiber internet connecting to the Olala pump house. Is there any information on what that specifically pertains to if it's a, a monitoring system or um, access for tools and IT for staff when they're working there. Thank you. Do you know the answer to that there? Danny, go ahead. Yes, I can answer that. Um, that's for actually both. So it's to tie in our SCADA system uh, directly into the monitoring of our VT SCADA system, as well as when staff is working on site that they'll be able to use their laptop and or phone connections to access services but it's not like a, a hotspot for just anybody. It's, it's tied to the SCADA. Okay, thanks.
Thank you. Uh, finance. Uh, so we just did award the contract for our asset management software in Q4 of 2022. So uh, we've started the, uh, this is phase four for us on our asset management program. So now the data entry into that new program uh, has commenced and uh, that'll keep going in Q1 of 2023. Uh, Q4 uh, 2022, uh, we're on a calendar year. Q4, always about budget. Uh, so the whole finance department, obviously very involved in that. And that uh, carries forward into Q1 uh, uh, each year. And then the other thing uh, for that is uh, they're busy preparing for the audit. Uh, so they, at the end of each calendar year, uh, our staff prepare the financial statements and then uh, the auditor comes in and uh, does their uh, audit on them and then he'll appear before you or they will uh, they usually bring a team uh, in I probably May of uh, 2023. Okay. So budget and financial statements uh, basically uh, take up the time for the finance department uh, and then just getting the asset management uh, program or organized um, this year. Human resources. Uh, so this was the one year uh, our policy on exempt employee compensation says we do a market survey every three years. Uh, this was the year for that. So Ms. Morgan uh, was busy doing, as <laughs> everybody, it, there, there's like 95 salary surveys that come out uh, every year. Um, we, I, I think we need to get organized as to how we can do this uh, provincially. But nevertheless, uh, we did ours and we pick out our matches and uh, she'll bring that in. Uh, very shortly. Uh, staff retention is a big issue for us. We have our staff retention plan. Um, we know that there's a lot of work being done in various organizations about uh, flexible work weeks or flexible work days. Uh, so uh, Carmen will come in and speak to committee about that uh, shortly. And then uh, in Q1 of 2023, uh, we're also trying to finish off on the job evaluation plan for our exempt staff. Obviously, we have one for our BCGU staff. Um, this is just a comparison of jobs, positions in the organization as to uh, based on certain parameters uh, that go then into a compensation uh, plan. Uh, but this is the evaluation of them comparing one job to the other. So she's working on that. Uh, we do our 360 degree evaluations on all of our leadership staff. So anybody that's supervising other employees gets a 360 on them. And then she uh, coordinates those. And then uh, we're also working on uh, training videos. Uh, so always a, always a comment we get through our staff reception survey from new staff is that uh, just as some of our new members here, it's like drinking from a fire hose when you come into an organization, is that there's so much that gets shoved at them the first couple of days through the orientation program that they need a refresher uh, from time to time. So uh, we're venturing into the video uh, type of uh, orientation program where they can go back and refer uh, to certain things uh, at times and then the other stuff. Uh, any other questions on the activity report, Mr. Chair? I don't believe I'm seeing any hands. Missing nobody on the screen, so I think okay. that covers it. That takes us down then to D, which is the organi Organizational Change Program. Yeah, can you bring up that PowerPoint, Danny? Um, let me see. I turned that off. Are we on? I turned okay. off. <laughs> All right. I've talked a lot about our staff perception survey that we do every year. So I thought I'd introduce the program to you that uh, requires that. Uh, just give you a bit of a history on it. And then... Um, some of the results 
that we've had. And I'll give you the 2022 results as well. And then uh, we'll also discuss as to whether your group wants to participate in the future. And I'll show you the longitudinal results from back in, uh, uh, from 2008 up to, uh, to uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in uh, some years in the past, the board has participated, some years they haven't, but uh, you can let us know what you think uh, about that. This all started for us back uh, in 2008. Uh, at the time, the regional district was uh, uh, going through some issues. Uh, not that we don't go through issues every year, but there were some uh, significant programs underway. The province was doing a regional district review, a governance review at the time, uh, looking to see if it might be, uh, one of the objectives out of that was to see if it might be beneficial to combine the three regional districts in the Okanagan, uh, so North, Central, and South. And uh, that was taking a couple of years. So during that time, uh, the regional, and the, the economy was flat, right? 2008 was that economic adjustment from the housing, the mortgage crisis. Uh, so the economy uh, was, uh, if not in recession, then very close. And uh, that always, that external environment always impacts on local governments. So uh, that, and of course, 2008 was an election year too uh, for local governments. But the regional governance review uh, during that time, the regional, our regional district wasn't replacing uh, some of the positions because they just didn't know what the corporation was going to look like or if there was going to be a corporation. Uh, and uh, 2008 was also the year that West Kelowna Incorporated, a number of our senior employees went up to West Kelowna, like the CAO and the CFO, who has since returned. That was Mr. Safino at the time. Um, uh, who went up to West Kelowna with Jason Johnson, who was the CAO. So uh, in 2008, there was an interim CAO and an interim uh, CFO and all of this other stuff that was going on. And uh, the organization was uh, uh, under stress. So uh, we looked for a process and I came in in 2008, once that regional governance review was complete. Uh, that's when I came in in August of uh, that year. So we were looking for a program to sort of rebuild the organization and to uh, bring some stability and uh, rebuild the, um, the focus. There was a program that had been developed by the International City Management Association um, uh, based on the eight characteristics of high performing organizations and really it was all based on this genre of what makes some local governments more successful than others. And uh, they had, uh, I'm not going to say stolen, but they had taken this uh, from a book that had been written back in the 80s by uh, Tom Peters and Bob Waterman called In Search of Excellence, who had gone out uh, into the private sector, these big Fortune 500 companies, and, and uh, that were under stress at the same time and uh, some were failing and some were succeeding. There was a lot of competition coming in, uh, the auto industry, the tech industry from the East. And uh, some were more successful than others and they found these eight characteristics in the private sector. So the International City Management Association hired a consulting group from the University of Santa Barbara to go ahead and do a study to see if they could uh, come up with something of the same that they could use for a leadership training package uh, at the time. So they did that study and they found out that the eight characteristics that uh, the private sector had uh, developed uh, were somewhat similar uh, for what would be successful in the public sector with one notable exception. And I'll tell you about that. But the whole premise of this was how can local governments provide better customer service? That was the whole foundation of it. Uh, and uh, they came up with what they called this linkage model that said, well, if you want to provide better customer service, you have to have uh, a high organizational climate. So uh, if you aspire to that, and if you follow or uh, build toward these eight characteristics of high performing organizations, you have a good chance of raising your organizational climate and there should be a correlation with citizen perception of service. 
So that was the foundation of it, was all about how do some local governments perform better in times of change than others. At the same time, uh, when Peters and Waterman wrote their writing, uh, their book, In Search of Excellence, there, there was all this, this other, it was a genre. Uh, Osborne and Gabriel, uh, uh, Gabler wrote Reinventing Government, and then Vanishing Bureaucracy, and then the Transformation Imperative, and then a Revolution in Public Management, and then even the Vice President of the United States came up with From Red Tape to Results. So all of this stuff about government uh, inefficiency and the need for improvement generally, so not just the regional district of Okanagan, Similkameen and this leadership training package, this was the concept uh, at the time. And uh, we go through stages like that. Uh, I would say like every, every 10 years, when I show you the results, our longitudinal results uh, on our, citizen, our uh, staff reception survey, I'll show you uh, how we have cycled, uh, even in uh, our regional district through some of those. So when the International City Management Association was doing their, I guess I should flip this over here, uh, was doing their study and they were looking at these characteristics and they looked at a number of academics who had written books on this area and done studies. Uh, Peters and Waterman, obviously the most famous, they wrote that book, made a lot of money, uh, but uh, they were a large consulting firm that they were working for at the time that did this. And then they went uh, back out and um, introduced this program uh, to these large Fortune 500 companies. And you can see that um, uh, on the key on the side that when they were doing this in the private sector, they said, okay, all these organizations, uh, they have lean, flat organizational structures. So, and when you're talking about a big Fortune 500 company, uh, uh, company, uh, they can often have like 50 or more layers of structure in their organizational chart. All those little boxes with the lines in between as to what the job is and who reports to who and who you have to go through in order to get to somebody else, uh, that it was taking too much time. Uh, and they were very uh, slow in response compared to some of these other organizations that they were competing against. So this whole thing about uh, really good structure, uh, uh, they said uh, out of these 10 consultants that they uh, looked at, all 10 had it. The other thing uh, the majority had was this clarity of purpose that all of these successful companies really understand what they're going to be doing and they promote that through their organization and they stick to it because at the time a lot of the private sector companies uh, when they were under stress from competition they'd look around and they'd buy some other company that they thought uh, could expand their holdings and make them more successful and when they got into them, they found they didn't know how to do that work and they were failing even quicker. So uh, the, the high performing companies said, this is what we do, we're gonna focus on it and we're gonna do it well. And they stuck to it. So that clarity of purpose uh, was very important. And then uh, the other ones there that you see, I'm gonna talk about uh, as we go through because when the International City Management Association in partnership with the University of Santa Barbara came up with their uh, study for local government, they said exactly the same thing. You better know what you're gonna do, what your services are, and you better do them well if you wanna be successful. So these are the eight characteristics that came out of the local government study. Um, and uh, this is an old process now, I've, and I'll show you some. <laughs> some uh, historical results from some of the organizations I've used it in uh, in the past. But these eight characteristics, they're very generic in nature. They're all uh, interdependent. They all rely on uh, the employees in the organization and the elected officials in the organization and uh, what you need to do in order to keep a focus uh, on the customer in order to improve uh, customer relations. There's a pretty standard process on this, and this is where our staff perception survey comes in. 
it says, first of all, you have to go out and introduce these eight characteristics to all of your staff. Secondly, you need to get their perspective because the other thing that comes out of this study is they say, if anybody knows the organization and what they're doing, it's your staff. So go out and ask them uh, whether you're doing it well or not. Uh, so that is our staff perception survey. They, they have a 32 question survey. There are four questions on each of these eight characteristics that we've used since 2008 uh, to get comparative results. And I'll show you the longitudinal results uh, later on. Um, but you've got to ask your employees to measure you against these eight characteristics. Once you get the staff perception survey, and for that, you get statistical results and you get the qualitative results. So the comment, once they measure you, you go out and ask them why they measured you the way they did. And they tell you, believe me. Um, and uh, it's all good information. And then you discuss where you wanna go from there. So for us, that's where we take the results. Uh, we organize a staff perception, uh, really it's an organizational development committee, to look at the results, develop a plan, implement the plan, make some sort of an intervention into the organization over the year, and then survey them again to see if we've made any difference. And I'll show you uh, the results on that. And uh, believe me, everything that you do as a group of elected officials has an impact <laughs> on how the staff measure us against these eight characteristics. And uh, as uh, like, hopefully at the end of this, you want to see your trend line increasing as far as the measure of organizational climate. Uh, if there's a blip, there's a reason for it. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, point some of those out when we go through them. But that's the process that's involved. And that's where the staff perception survey comes in uh, for us. So these uh, eight characteristics, I'm gonna go through these really quickly. The first they say all high performing organizations have this bias for action. It's like an attitude. They have really good environmental scanning techniques, meaning they go out and ask their citizens what their issues are before they become problems, try and be proactive. They have a good problem solving process that every employee knows so that they can take ownership of an issue, get it from point of entry to point of decision, and then take action. And then every once in a while, uh, if you've made a change, you go back, you evaluate it. If it worked, great. If it didn't, you tinker with it, try something else. The second one they called, uh, this is the focus on citizens. So in the study, they called it closeness to citizens. And this is where they say in high performing organizations, employees take this personally. When they have a job to do, uh, they take ownership of it and uh, they know whether they're doing well or not, um, and uh, you need them to invest. So it's all about keeping citizens informed. Uh, and we used to get away with that, just telling people what we were gonna do. You can't do that anymore. Uh, now uh, we went through the whole phase of consultation and now we're into full citizen engagement. Uh, and uh, citizens expect to have an opportunity to come into the decision-making process uh, and be involved in it uh, to that extent. And we know that all local governments are spending much more time on communication and engagement and inviting citizens in uh, so that we know what their uh, needs are. And the other thing they said was, this is not uh, something that people are born with, that you've got to train them. You have to have customer service training and you've got to have techniques and you've got to have ways of dealing with difficult people because from time to time, uh, we do things they don't like. Uh, you got to train staff on how to respond on that. The third one, they called autonomy and entrepreneurship. And we all know what entrepreneurship is in the private sector. In the, in the public sector, uh, what they're saying is that the high performing local governments encourage their employees to take risks on their behalf and then they support them when they do because you only get one shot at that. You encourage somebody to take a risk and you put them out in the end of a diving board and there's no water in the pool. That is the last time they will do that. So uh, very important and you've got to earn that. But on the other side, uh, and we're not talking about reinventing the wheel. This is, this is talking about 
making small incremental changes. It's almost that continuous improvement mindset where they're always looking at processes or equipment uh, or uh, opportunities to make improvements in what they're doing and the stuff that they know best. It's like that lean management uh, thinking that we, uh, uh, that is popular right now where you take a process and you, uh, who touches it, uh, where does it go, where are the gaps, how can we shorten it, what can we get rid of uh, that will make it more efficient and, uh, and then entrenching that. This fourth one is the one that talks about how the organization treats employees. So it's all about respectful workplace and bringing them into the larger picture discussions uh, about where the organization's going, certainly about keeping them safe. And then um, it doesn't talk about wages or benefits in this process. They just expect that organizations will pay fairly and have fair benefits. And then they say, what else do you do? Uh, that these high performing local governments have a pervasive set of employee recognition programs uh, to um, make sure that employees understand that they are their most important resource and their competitive advantage and all those other things uh, that organizations talk about, uh, but don't always uh, uh, express themselves in. One of the questions on the survey that the employees do, it says, uh, uh, I forget what it is now, it's like, uh, is, does the organization do more than lip service? Uh, which is, yes, a lot of organizations will talk about how important employees are, but then they don't have the supporting programs uh, to uh, show them how they do that. So those first four, those are how we measure organizational climate. They're very transactional in nature. Uh, they're work unit based. They're not organizational based. Every, uh, every small group in the organization uh, can have a much different organizational climate than another. Uh, and they can change overnight with a new employee or certainly a new supervisor. That that uh, team fit uh, will determine what the organizational climate is like and whether the employees enjoy coming to work or not, right? If you're not enjoying your work, if there's, if there's this uh, confrontation or controversy within a work unit, um, that is trouble. So those first four uh, are how we measure organizational climate. These next five uh, are the organizational culture ones. They're transformational. You can only have one set of values for an organization. Uh, you, it, they take years to make a change on, right? And they're, they have to be corporate in nature. It doesn't change for each uh, work unit. So in this process, though, so they say all high-performing organizations have values. In fact, all organizations have values. The good ones write them down and they communicate them to their employees. And that's what they use then to make those value-based decisions. So you can empower your employees to go ahead and make decisions as long as they're doing them in accordance with the values, they should be safe. So that's that employee empowerment. Uh, type of discussion. The next one's uh, we mission goals and competence. We wrap this into our strategic planning process, and it's about this clarity of purpose and uh, clearly identifying what business we're in, and then sticking to it. And uh, the questions around this one are always about the things we do. Do we do well? And I'll show you on our longitudinal results where that started to change for us um, back around 2017. And, and speculate on why. But clarity of purpose is always very important. Uh, remember I said back on that second slide where all high performing organizations, everything that uh, everybody they talked to in this study said that uh, uh, organizational structure was the foundation of success. In this process, they said high performing organizations have flat lean organizational structures. And it's all about communication and flexibility, right? You gotta be nimble sometimes. And even though we have some inherent disadvantages because we're a government, I mean, we, we have to follow legislation. There is still those that fight through that bureaucracy, even their own, 
in order to be responsive. So a flat lean organization in this study says, try and reduce the number of layers in your organization as much as possible, because we can get absorbed by that. All, all of those boxes and the lines uh, that lead up to say a department head um, in some organizations, if you just follow that organizational structure and an employee in one department needs to get something from an, an employee in another department, if you have to go up to his supervisor, to his manager, to his director, who can then talk to another director to get permission to talk to his guy, it can take a long time and become moribund, right? So the, the high performing organizations have, uh, they're as flat and as lean as possible. And they say, if you have to choose, uh, not that support functions aren't important, but if you have to choose where your resources are gonna go, put them on the line departments who are serving the customer, right? Try and keep your support functions as lean as possible. This freedom and control one, again, it's about having that uh, firm central direction so employees can feel empowered to go ahead and make their own decisions. If you've got good policy and you've got good procedures, then employees can take an issue and work through it uh, to the end. Uh, I mean, obviously some things are gonna be uh, uh, advanced either up to a higher level in the organization or to the board. But uh, most of the time, if it's a day-to-day -day activity, you want your employees to just go ahead and make those decisions. I mean, we don't have entry level employees really anymore. Everybody comes in with a certificate or a designation or a requirement for certain knowledge. Um, and uh, they're quite capable of uh, making decisions. They're all adults. So the more that you can uh, shove the decision-making authority down into the organization, uh, the better off you're gonna be. And then communication gets easier, the flatter you are. And this thing about stick to the knitting, that again is that one that says, choose your services as to what you're gonna do and then do them well. Don't get into stuff that you don't know how to do or that you aren't going to resource. Just don't do it. Because, uh, and I'll show you on the longitudinal results where we got caught in that um, uh, back in 2017. Not uh, intentionally got caught in it, but uh, there are these things that happen outside of us in the bigger world that have an impact on how we uh, perform as well. Go ahead, director. <laughs> Conan, yes, <laughs> that's okay. There's so many of us. Uh, I just mean is is um, just bringing that forward to current day issues. Is that stay in your lane? Stay in your lane. Yeah. So we're to figure yeah. out what we're supposed to be doing as opposed to the province. That would certainly have a bearing on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, you can spin uh, in circles trying to do somebody else's job, where you're never going to be successful. Uh, just trying to find my agenda here. Where are we? Where are we supposed to be? Uh, an hour. Okay. We're doing all right. <coughs> Only like an hour behind. Um, <laughs> so let me talk then, uh, remind you again as to why we set out to do this. So uh, on this study, uh, in the end, they said, the preponderance of empirical information indicates the most effective methodology uh, to improve customer service is to improve, increase the cultural and climatic strength of the organization, okay? So, I mean, the old colloquy, happy employee, happy customer, basically is what they're saying. <clears throat> this is the linkage model uh, that was developed out of this. They said, if you want your citizens to have a, uh, a higher perception of service, then implement these eight characteristics uh, into your organization, ask your employees to measure you against them, increase the climate strength of the organization. And there is a correlation between citizen perception of service and employee perception results, that there is a correlation. And I'll show you some examples of how that might work. So uh, 
I mentioned I, I've done the same process in some of the other organizations uh, I've worked with. So I've, I just picked out uh, four, including the RDOS. And I wanted to show you the difference between uh, sort of the first year that we started and then uh, the second year. So one year after. Remember I said on the process, you introduce these eight characteristics to your organization. You ask your employees to measure you against these eight characteristics. You ask them why. You make some sort of an intervention into the uh, organization over the year. And then you measure again. Okay, so it's like a test one, test two. It's like a pilot project. You survey people, and then you make your intervention, and then you go back and survey them again to see if it worked. So on this slide uh, here, um, so I first used this uh, back in Bonneville, Alberta, back in 1987, and then again in 88. Okay? And you can see that... Um, out of these eight characteristics, which are down the left-hand column, uh, we came up with the mean. So you can see in Bonneville, uh, when I first did this with the organization, they scored it 17.3, it's out of 28, right? On the survey, there are four questions and the highest score on the Likert scale can be seven. So four times seven is 28. So the highest score would be 28. You can see Bonneville scored 17.3 the first year and it went up to 19.5 the year after. Yeah. I'll explain standard deviation, why I measure that later. Uh, in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, started out uh, in 90, they were at 14.1 out of 28. So issues in Portage La Prairie. This sort of gives you a, like this is not a statistically correct survey. This is a perception survey. There's too many variables that you don't measure for uh, over the long run. Uh, to call it statistically correct, even though we survey all of the employees. We don't use a sample. We, we survey all employees. But even so, there's just not enough uh, consistency between years to, uh, um, to really call it statistically correct. So started out at 14.1. You can see that after the first year, they went up to 17.2. Whitehorse, we started off at 15.1. Uh, they came up to 18.4 after the first year. And with the regional district back in 2008, we started out at 18.9. We came up to 20.6 uh, uh, after the first year. So just down below, you can see the, the increase, the uh, quantum increase over the year. You can see for the regional district between 2008, 2009, they came up 1.7. Um, so out of 28. Uh, which was a good increase. The percentage increase was 8%. So this is our measure of organizational climate, right? This is how we put a statistic around it, uh, just based on this uh, Likert scale. But you can see in different organizations, of course, they had uh, a longer way to come. We actually started out at a fairly high level uh, in the regional district, even with those problems that I uh, talked about at the start. But you can see uh, Bonneville went up 11%, Portage La Prairie went up 18%, Whitehorse went up 18%, and the regional district went up um, 8%. So as a measure of organizational climate, that's promising for a CAO. So you come in, you, you put all this work into doing this study and implementing it and get everybody excited about it. Because, uh, and I have to say, uh, after the first year, they really are probably giving you marks for good intentions just because you're asking. Um, uh, but it's the following years that uh, uh, where you entrench it into the organization, uh, those are important too. But I used Whitehorse. So remember I said that there is this correlation between the staff measure of climate and citizen perception of service. So, oh, I didn't. Uh... Yeah, so uh, using Whitehorse, so they first did the survey, uh, a citizen survey, uh, back in 1998. And then they did a follow-up one uh, four years later. Okay. So you can see that those citizens in Whitehorse that mark uh, uh, per perception of service as excellent or good was 76%. By 2002, uh, it had gone up to 87%. Okay. 
So again, a good, a good indication that there is that correlation as, and I showed you the, the staff perception of survey in Whitehorse went up a really high 18% over that first year. So on that trend line, uh, the correlation between measure of organizational climate and, staff and citizen perception of service was significant in Whitehorse. Uh, the other question we always ask, and we ask these on our, our surveys as well, is uh, are you getting good value for taxes? And you can see in, which is never a popular question, um, but in 1996, uh, the answer in Whitehorse was 70% said yes. In 1998, it went up, it stayed at 70%. And then by 2002, uh, it had gone up to 74. So the trend line uh, on that correlation, again, is encouraging. A lot tougher to change citizen perception of service than it is to change an organizational climate. Like remember I said, the organizational climate characteristics are very transactional. They can change quickly, not so quick uh, on citizen perception of service, but nevertheless, uh, promising. Um, so this is, uh, this is ours. So uh, on this spreadsheet, you can see that we did our first uh, citizen perception survey in 2010. Um, so, and the intent was to do it every uh, two years. We vary between two and three, but nevertheless, uh, where we ask uh, for citizen perception of service in 2010, uh, we had uh, Thirty-one percent uh, that were agreeing that we had uh, good service. Uh, we didn't ask the same question as we did in Whitehorse uh, as to whether it was good or excellent. It was just, uh, do you agree or do you disagree? Um, so on this one, uh, thirty-one percent saying, "Yeah, we get good service." By 2012, it had gone up to thirty-five percent. Stayed sort of flat. Uh, went to thirty-three percent in 2014, and then. Um, this measure of 5.9 in 2017 uh, was, so uh, we got up to 6.1 in 2012 and then we stayed fairly flat. Okay. When we ask if they're getting good uh, fair value for taxes paid, you can see we started out at 5.7 in 2017, we were up at 6.3. So uh, there is that difference between regional districts and incorporated communities. Uh, corporate communities are sort of uh, much more holistic. Uh, they have a, a um, more impact. I think all citizens get the same service with a regional district. We have 166 different services. So different groups of ratepayers get different uh, stuff from us. Um, so generally, I'm not surprised it's lower. I don't like it that we're down at 63%, but um, you know, the only thing we can do is keep on working uh, in order to try and, and improve that. So uh, questions on this, then I'm going to show you the longitudinal results. Got a question from Director Barkwell. Uh, thank you, Chair. What is the mean? I uh, didn't, uh, you have percentages there, but you have a mean of, of, of what uh, sort of rate, what rating scale? Yeah, based on those questions. So on the citizen perception survey, uh, let me go back to that. Okay. So on, uh, is the RDOS doing a good job? Uh, we started out at 5.6 uh, out of 10, right? 56% uh, in 2010. Uh, we were up to uh, 59% in 2017. On do you receive good value or fair value for your taxes? Started out at 57%. Uh, we were up to 63% in 2017. Oh, go ahead, Director Conant. Uh, to the chair, doesn't this also have to do with what the public perceives is the job of the RDOS? For example, I remember in when I was on the board in 2018, I believe it was the customer survey um, for, cus for our customers or for the citizens. They thought that roads was the most important thing, that one of the most important things that, we f that the RDOS the job the RDOS does and which is obviously not the job of the RDOS. So um, that 
would be an issue in taking the citizen survey if they're not sure of what our what our uh, responsibilities are. There's all sorts of variables we don't measure for. <laughs> so on that one, what we're after is what is their perception? So if they think we are doing a service that we're not, that still forms their perception in my mind. So we need to do a better job of informing people about what we do. That's our responsibility. So, but nevertheless, their perception of how we're doing, whether it's on a service we do or not, they just want the service. Director Weep, that spreadsheet, Danny. Yeah. Director Weep, go ahead. And through the chair, uh, this is there's 400 respondents. Is that a typical from year to year that you get 400, or you collect 400? Oh, on the White Horse survey? Yeah, so that was. Was that the White Horse one? Yeah. I thought that was the RDOS one. Um, let me just see. If I, yeah. So if you're doing a statistically correct survey, there is a certain number of uh, people that you have to measure for. Uh, so uh, was it this one on? Um, so the, the number looked really low on the RDOS, and I just wanted to clarify that. And then to follow up with, is there any way to kind of chart which parts of the RDOS it's coming from, or is it just collected as a group? Because, I mean, people moving in and out, I'm sure if you ask for, you know, customer satisfaction or, or uh, taxpayer satisfaction in one area of the RDOS versus another from, you know, three to four years apart, you might get very different results. Yeah, and we do ask uh, for a geographic location on the perception of, uh, on the citizen perception survey. And when we report out on that survey, uh, we can give you that information. For our purposes on this one, it's just an overall What's your satisfaction? Yeah, so on a random sample, uh, if you're doing 400, so on Whitehorse, there was, about, I don't know, 27 or 28,000 people. So the statisticians said, well, 400 is your sample size that you need to do to get a 95% uh, confidence that you're uh, correct within 4% uh, of the general population. Yeah. Okay, so can you put up that survey, Danny? Uh, the results. All right. So what I want to show you is uh, uh, we do this annually. Uh, and we have done since 2008. So from 2008 uh, to 2022, uh, we uh, are broken into 11 groups. So we do all of the employees in the organization. And uh, from time to time, the board is uh, played as well. Yep, make that little bigger. <laughs> um, uh, so 11 work groups, because we like to get them small enough that they can have a good discussion about why they rated the organization the way they did. So, um, no, wrong one. I need the, the Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. That's the PowerPoint. Yeah, so if you go into EDMS and corporate services, there, yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So uh, this is my tally of how we're doing from year to year. Uh, and I like statistics, so every once in a while uh, you dig these out and you look at them and say, oh, why did that happen or why did that happen? Um, so if you look across the very top row, you'll see uh, uh, action orientation. So the eight characteristics. Uh, we measure separately. If you look down the left-hand column, you'll see uh, the 11 work groups that we surveyed. Uh, and you get a sense of the mood from each, uh, again, very transactional when you're measuring climate. So it, it gives you an idea of how each of the work units uh, are feeling from time to time. And then it gives you an overall average. So uh, just based on time, um, oh, we got lots of time. So action orientation, that's one, that one that says, okay, high performing local governments, uh, they have really good environmental scanning techniques. They know what the issues are before they become problems, good problem solving process, real bias for action if they know that change is required. Uh, you can see that the overall average in 2008 uh, was 18.5. Uh, we went up that second year. So we surveyed, 
we got the results, we made an intervention into the organization, and we surveyed again at the end of, the, of uh, that first year of intervention. Uh, we went up by a point and a half. Again, these are out of 28. This is the highest score. So we went up a point and a half, which is significant. Um, 2010, so uh, some members, Mark for sure will recall this, 2010 was our operational audit year. So flat economy, uh, we retracted, uh, we went down uh, in our employee work base by 10% uh, following our operational audit. That has an impact on employees. So you find out during their measure of uh, climate how they're feeling. So uh, we went down, but then you can see we went up again significantly the following year. So we started to recover. Uh, we stayed pretty flat uh, on this one uh, throughout. Uh, 2017 and 18 are transitional years for us, and I'm going to talk more about that um, in a sec. But you can see, okay, we started out at 18.5. We had some good years in there, but then we started a downward trend line uh, from 2017. Okay, we went down a lot uh, over that year. So by 2018, uh, we'd lost a couple of points, and we've stayed there. Okay, we're back up this year. So hopefully this is the start of an upward trend line for us. Uh, and I can say generally that on most of these eight characteristics, it looks like we're going back up uh, in 2022. Uh, and now it's our job to continue that. Closeness to citizens, uh, our highest rank characteristic out of the eight when we're asking our staff to measure themselves against this. Um, can you move that along, Danny? Just slide it over. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is the one that says, okay, keep everybody informed, do your consultations, citizen engagement, uh, make sure your employees are, are investing themselves uh, in the customer service. You can see in 2008, we started out at 21.3, which was our highest mark that year. You, I mean, we stayed up um, pretty good and then you can see 2017 started to come down um, by 2018, 2019. Um, we stayed pretty flat, but this was a low score for this characteristic. Uh, we're still at 20.4. It, it's still our highest result on 2022, but it's not back up to where we were uh, be, before we started our downward trend line. Uh, slide over, Danny. So autonomy and entrepreneurship, this is one that encourages employees to take risks and then the employee, uh, the employer supports them for it. Started at 19.6. Uh, we're still at 18.6. So again, uh, we started that downward trend line in 2017. And uh, hopefully, we're starting to go back up now. Okay, and then employee orientation. This is the one that talks about how the organization treats employees. Uh, started at 19.4. Uh, again, we went up. Operational audit, we went down, went back up, uh, and we're pretty stable. We took a three-year gap uh, between 2012 to 2015 just because the, the group was getting <laughs> jaded. We had a very stable workforce at that point. Same people filling in the same survey over a number of years. They get a little bit tired. So we came up with a new, we're always going to work on organizational development, uh, but we came up with some new processes uh, to do that. And then we went back to this process in 2015. Uh, you can see that we're at 18.7 for 2022, which is, uh, I mean, there's, there is that upward projection. Uh, we were at 17.8 in 2020. Uh, then we went back up, and now uh, we're holding our own on that one. Uh, down and back to the start, Danny. So um, this one about mission goals and competence, uh, this is a clarity of purpose one. Uh, these are the cultural ones now, transformational. Uh, started at 18.6. Uh, we're still at 17.8, one of our lower scores. Uh, but you can see, again, we started that downward trend line in 2017. Uh, organizational structure, we started at 18.8. We're at 18 now, so still lower than where we started. But again, uh, downward trend line in 2017. 
Political relationships. So political relationships is that one talks about uh, high performing organizations have a mutual trust and respect between the elected officials and their staff. There's good two way communication uh, in the organization. Uh, so freedom to uh, talk informally uh, and move about the organization. Uh, and uh, really it says that one can't be successful without the other. Uh, uh, our board can't be successful if their staff aren't implementing the policies, plans, programs uh, that they come up with, right? And certainly administration is not going to be successful on their own uh, if they aren't getting uh, the leadership and direction uh, and oversight that the board provides. So uh, this is about how we work together. Um, you can see 16.6 back in 2008, uh, there were some problems again, because uh, really, the board at that time didn't know what the future of the regional district was. Uh, big gaps uh, in in uh, some of the positions in the organization. People were moving on. A lot of them went up to West Kelowna. Really bad economy uh, at the time. So 16.6 on this one. Uh, we're at 17.7 now. It was the lowest factor in 2008. And uh, that's what the Organizational Development Committee chose to work on in 2009. And you can see this one uh, went up really significantly. Uh, went way back down in 2010 because of the operational audit, but then again uh, um, started upwards. And then in 2017, uh, again, a uh, downward trend line. Starting back up, it was still the lowest score on uh, the 2022 survey, uh, but... Um, Hopefully this again is the start of uh, the upward trend line. Okay, so a down and over again, Danny. So this is our measure of organizational climate. Uh, this is the average of all the eight characteristics. Uh, and you can see uh, again, down the left-hand column are the 11 work groups. You can see that the board uh, has played um, before. Uh, uh, 2018 was an election year, so uh, a big turnover, 65% turnover in the board uh, in 2018. So we didn't play that year. Uh, started in 2019, and then uh, just because of circumstances, uh, uh, didn't include them uh, for the last three years. Um, so overall, we started at 18.9 and we had a standard deviation of uh, 0.99, so almost one, almost a one. So on a standard deviation, that's not bad in my mind. Really the importance of, uh, of standard deviation is that it shows the difference between the work units. Really in a high performing organization, you want all employees to feel uh, that uh, they're being treated the same uh, and to get the same measurement from them on this type of an exercise. So uh, a one, uh, one point on a standard deviation uh, is not bad. Uh, certainly been seen higher. In fact, uh, this year we're at 1.9. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, like anything over a one on a standard deviation to me, it, you know, you should be looking into it. Um, so this is something we have to work in. It's not the highest we've ever had, uh, but it's high. Um, so these are the 11 work groups. This is the measure of, of organizational climate, this average line. You can see started out at 18.9. Um, we went up uh, after that first year, went back down because of the operational audit. Uh, we're doing pretty good, like anything over a 20. This is a, like a 20 out of 28. So it's not bad as far as a measure of organizational climate. And then in 2017, we started a downward trend line. Uh, that just kept going uh, until this year. And hopefully uh, we're starting that up. So why is that? What happened in 2017? Egregious flood year. Oh my God. We started March 23rd. We went all year in the EOC. Everybody was diverted. Uh, uh, they couldn't do their own work. Uh, they got stressed out. Um, they got... Uh, 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 I mean, we started seeing a lot more uh, long-term disability because of stress uh, in the organization. 2018 was just as bad. Like we were eight to 10 months of emergency operations center work. 
At the same time, that's when the growth started in British, by British Columbia for sure, maybe Canada, but uh, certainly in the Okanagan Sinokamine. And we've seen that over the last uh, seven years. The, the development counter just went, it started going crazy. Everybody was overworked. Uh, at the same time, they were diverted into the EOC. All those questions that we ask on the survey, the, the, where it said uh, the things that you do, you do very well. Uh, up to, that had been one of our highest marked questions uh, over all of those years until 2017. And they said, we're trying, but the things that we're doing now, we can't do well. So uh, you get low marks on that and that uh, gets invested in the result. That hap that's happened every year since. And you can never catch up in a growth economy. For a local government, we're very cautious. We, we, we want to see a three-year trend that growth is going to continue, uh, that we need to start increasing resources in order to meet demand uh, because it's a budget factor and it's a perceptual factor. Uh, so in a retraction, it's easy to manage. Like if you're cutting employees from a, a, a management point of view, you don't like it, but it's easy because you've got too many employees to do the work that you've been given to do. In a growth economy, you never catch up until you can stabilize. So hopefully we're at a point where we can get stable again. Um, and maybe that's why we're starting to see uh, an increase or maybe because the board has approved uh, the increase in positions. Um, even though now the problem is the market's so hot uh, that there's great mobility uh, for municipal employees, especially in those hard to recruit positions like building inspector and planner and eng tech and so on. So uh, you got lots of vacancies. Um, during this, this time was again where we started to see a lot of turnover in the organization. Up until that point, we'd been very stable, uh, very little turnover. Uh, really the workforce uh, had been the same for years and years. And then at that time we started to see the turnover, a lot of new employees coming in, uh, takes time to get oriented, especially when you're working half your uh, days in the EOC. Uh, so all of those factors led up to that downward trend line. And what we need to do now is catch up and start trying to turn this around. Uh, in the meantime, every year we're working on trying to address the weaknesses that our staff points out to us through these organizational development plans. But you, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. So uh, everything on here, when, I mean, we're just looking at numbers. We get comments with these as well. Our employees tell us why they're ranking the organization the way they did. Uh, so, uh, and we give that to our uh, organizational development committee. But at the same time, uh, it, I'm, I would not be surprised if we have a downward trend on our customer satisfaction survey, because again, there is that correlation if our employees are telling us that we're not doing very well, uh, certainly our citizens are gonna tell us the same. So uh, that will be interesting uh, to see what the results are on this one. Um, so <laughs> in 2020, on top of all this other stuff, of course, the pandemic, right? And then later on in 2020, our cyber attack. Uh, so, uh, with the pandemic, uh, we changed our approach on this. We still did our staff perception survey, but instead of creating a committee, uh, because that just wasn't the, the uh, right time to be creating committees where people get in close quarters and, and strategize, uh, we decided that we'd start working on customer service, which is where Ms. Malden and, and Ms. Morgan uh, took the lead. Uh, uh, to develop a customer service program, um, which ended up being the Tracy Lorenzen uh, thing with staff and with the board and now uh, further development. So uh, we'll see if that uh, has an impact as well. Uh, so that's the program. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, do you want to 
participate in this in future years or do you just want to see the results or how do you want to play? Hmm. Director Weeb, go ahead. Oh, and I think if we have, if we're looking at how staff are responding and the one was how it, it works with board, it'd be interesting to see how the board feels it's working with staff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one to hear one side, but to have the other and go, we thought we were doing better here. And obviously the staff perception is different. Um, so I think it might be helpful to, uh, especially for a number of us that are new. Okay. Director McCordoff. Thank you. Yeah, I've taken part in a couple of these and, um, and I find them that it makes me think about, uh, about some of the issues. So I'm definitely in favor of, of being involved again. I think it's quite helpful. Thank you. Okay. Director Monteith. And through the chair, I fully agree. I know that when I'm looking at the statistics, I'm actually looking to see what our board has said in the past. So I feel that even though it may take some of our time, I think the high value to doing the survey for us to know now, but future boards to understand how things were for us at that time. So I think it is very important that we all participate and I highly encourage us to do that. Okay. I see a trend, but I'll go to Director Roberts. Yeah. Should I make the motion? The motion that uh, <laughs> we do. <laughs> we can do that. You'll make that motion. Is there a I seconder for that? Motion. That the board takes part. It's seconded. So, will Director Canodal, you had a hand up as well. You have something to add? Most definitely. If we don't measure it, we can't tell. Even if we have a problem, much less fix it. So. We need to keep the measurements in place. Okay. Any other thoughts? Director Monteith? Through the chair, um, I know that I've mentioned before, and I know other directors have as well. Um, I do think it's important that we're including our fire departments in this as well. So they are seen in our communities as providing a very vital service, but yet their feedback isn't received. So um, is there a possibility to start now moving forward, adding them into this feedback? Thank you. CAO, can you? Uh, they wouldn't do well in this type of a survey, uh, Mr. Chair. So I would say if you want to do that, if you want to get their perceptions on certain things, uh, we should develop a program for them, but it wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't help them to do this one. Okay, Director Miller. Uh, to the CEO, through the chair, why not? So this process is uh, about the corporation. So even though we break them into work units, it's about how is the regional district organization doing as a whole. So uh, the fire departments, they wouldn't know uh, what we do um, for these types of questions. Uh, that they would respond on. They'd certainly know the fire department and how they do as an organization, but they wouldn't, um, like the questions are when problems are identified, this organization moves quickly to solve them. They don't know what our problem solving process is, or we, uh, they're, they're really not close enough uh, to know that sort of thing. Do, do we go out and identify problems promptly as a corporation? Uh, they wouldn't know that sort of thing. Um, when we talk about do managers have direct frequent contact with citizens? They don't know. We would, we would have to do something specific to the fire department uh, to make it valuable. Okay, follow up. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, I would agree with Director Monteith. Uh, I think there could be a perception of exclusion and I think the fire departments should be included because I guess in my line of work, um, which is uh, newspapers, it would be like if we polled every single uh, com committee and department or whatever, but we're going to put the carriers separately. They're usually by far the most talented people that we do have, so I would be in favor, if it's possible, of including them in somehow. Okay. Not seeing, is there a hand? Is that a hand still up, Director Knodel? No, it's a comment to this. Uh, we keep telling the fire departments that they're part of our organization, but we're going to exclude them from any of the act, uh, certain activities. Uh, it doesn't help to bring them into the fold. So uh, we definitely need to move ahead with uh, Director Monteith's uh, suggestion. So we might want to make a motion 
to that effect after this one is done. Yeah, this one is specifically to us as the board partaking in future. Correct. Did I see a hand or miss a hand over here? Taylor. Director Taylor, are you no. tentatively okay? <laughs> All right, we'll call the question then on the board taking part in these. All those in favor? Okay, any opposed? Looks like we're in. <laughs> Another prep. Oh, Director Coyne, I can see your hand once in a while, but I'm not seeing you. So, were you opposed? Oh, that's a mistake. It's just lagging. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So, motion okay. carries still. <laughs> Thanks. Can you bring up that 23 business plan, Danny? Director Monteith? So to follow up, do we now make a motion then to have a survey done for the fire departments that would perhaps um, involve them in the process at some acceptable level, I guess. I don't know how to word that, but I mean, it, I don't want to survey them of no value. I want to make sure that we're surveying them, that it's high value information that we're getting back. Okay. Maybe we should let the CAO think of how that might work out here and come back to us here at a future date as to how we could include them and and to get some value in there because yeah. we want to include them where it does make sense. So any thoughts on that, CAO? Well, I think before that, Mr. Chair, we have to have this discussion about what is the relationship with the fire departments. At this point in time, they are uh, uh, separate and distinct, right? They, they operate independently. Uh, we had this discussion after the master plan back in 2017, and uh, there is no there is no resource within the organization that relates with fire departments. There's no manager. Uh, there's no oversight on them. They're each separate and distinct. They have they've incorporated. Uh, they hire their own administrator. So for us to involve them in a process like this would really be useless. Okay, Director Bloomfield and. Thank you, and through the chair, and uh, I thoroughly agree that we should be getting uh, a survey of the opinions of the fire departments. Um, however, including it in this survey would actually skew the results for a um, historical comparison. So uh, I think that uh, having a different survey uh, just for the fire departments would be extremely useful. And But uh, I also see the value in keeping it separate from this survey just so those results don't get skewed. Okay. So do we want to make a motion or are we going to have a further discussion on how we deal with fire departments? Go ahead, Director Monteith. So through the chair, speaking with fire chiefs, um, they do utilize some of the internal services within the regional district. They use our finance department, HR, they, you know, you know, sometimes legislative services. So they are using services within the regional district, but, and they are interacting. So there is a value to getting their opinions and their, their, um, I guess, rating on how things are going. And, and so as a board, we know how to support them better. And I know if I, if I have a statistical, reference to be able to understand where their challenges are that would help me set their budget as a director right and work with them to be able to build a budget that makes sense for them if they're struggling and we don't have the resources within the regional district then i need i need to understand that and see that and my residents do as well so um I, we think i think we do need something and i agree with uh, director bloomfield that um putting them together doesn't make sense because they are unique but there is high value to doing something so that's where i'm at Okay, Director Roberts. Oh, thank you. And I think in regards to a follow-up, what the CAO uh, mentioned, I think it's time to look at the governance model in regards to our fire departments, whether or not we call um, economy of scale, training, admin support, et cetera. Um, whether or not you want to call it uh, what it's called in other uh, jurisdictions and other regional districts as a um, regional district um, overarching chief or whether or not you call it a manager or a managing uh, body. But I think we need to 
bring back into the fold the full supports and the ability to work synergistically between the, the furthest little uh, brigades at the extent of the regional district to those in our in our villages and uh, communities. So, um, you know, I would like to see us clean this up because I don't believe the model that we've done so far is working. Um, we see such great divisions from uh, far-flung uh, brigades and fire halls out to as far as East States and Eris and Tulamine to the the fire departments that have their own managing body, but they stand alone. And then Naramata is um, different again. So um, I think it's really tough. We are either going to have a regional uh, format with all the supports in place and all the cost savings through a scales of economy um, and support for the fire chiefs. Um, Otherwise, we're just kind of dealing it with one fire hall, one community, one electoral area at a time. Um, opinion as it stands, anyways. Thank you. Okay. Director Knodel hand, and then I'll go to Director Miller. Once again, we have an asset here. If we're not measuring its uh, involvement in the organization, we're not seeing where the problems are. So I'd like to move that we create a, 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 a set of questions that moves this forward uh, and leave it open for um, uh, amend amendment as necessary to make it fit for the fire departments. Okay. That work? Seconding that. Okay, motion is on the floor, Director Miller. Yes, I just think uh, if we spend 15 minutes talking about staff morale, I think, um, I think it's important to at least ask them or give them the opportunity to complete the survey. Uh, I know I get a lot of uh, surveys through work and civic work and sometimes I ignore them, especially when it says this is going to take 20 minutes, but at least I'm asked. <laughs> and I think that's important. And as Director Knodel said, uh, um, it may prove to be valuable um, data that's received, but the big thing is, is that, um, if we're going to ask everybody else, I think there should be a separate survey. I'll be glad to support uh, the motion. Okay. Director Conant? Yes, uh, through the chair. I, I listened to the explanation from our CAO about why it wasn't appropriate to include them. So for me to support this motion, I'm going to have to, I would need a complete staff presentation on the history of this uh, the fire departments, I, I was there in 2017, 2008, but I, it's foggy to me, but I know it was very complicated and, uh, and a very difficult time at uh, the decisions that were made at that time. And also um, how it stands now, what is our relationship and what, what services does each um, department use? So I wouldn't be able to support this until I got a, st I received a, a staff presentation on what our relationship is with the fire departments right now. Okay, Director Weep. And through the chair, if I could uh, kind of uh, speak to what Director Roberts brought up, is that uh, I think it's fair in some certain circumstances, the nature of the relationship is unclear between the regional district and some of the fire departments. And so trying to get an, an accurate assessment when that relationship isn't clear could actually be problematic. So I would like to see that we um, move towards uh, getting information and doing some of these reports, but I think without clear and concise relationship and and the, and legislating or having kind of uh, established rules or guidelines or something that we're we're following, it's difficult to try to track something that's a you know from one department to another may not be the same. You might not be tracking the same thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. I just, uh, we do have a motion on the floor, but I would just want to make it clear that everybody's aware that, I mean, when we talk fire departments, there's really only, maybe I better get the numbers right here, eight fire departments that the regional district is responsible for. There are some that are brigades that wouldn't be included that we have no relationship with other than sometimes an area director throws some money their way when they can come up with some to help out, but and we're definitely not talking about the municipal fire department. So it's just the eight 
rural fire departments. So everybody's clear on that. Director Holmes. Um, I'm not clear on what the motion uh, says or means. I wonder if we could get it's, that. It's to develop a set of questions that we could put forth to the fire departments at this time. I'm not sure what we're going to do with that, though, which is the, probably another discussion uh, to have. Go ahead. So it'd be separate than, than what we're working on now? Yeah, yeah. It would, I don't see it as being put into this specifically because it's potentially different questions. It would be hard to throw into this same mix. Seeing no more hands. Oh, Director Taylor. I expect to be speaking against the motion. I think we need to indicate support for the fire services, but I think the problem is bigger than this particular question. Yes. I do think it's important that we communicate that we value the services, <clears throat> not by getting a survey, by clarifying that our relationship with them. Yeah. Okay. I see a hand from Director Federigo. Thank you, through the chair. But would starting or putting some form of questions out to them start conversation? Like, I get that we don't want to just give them a survey just for the sake of doing that, but that may be where we can start to identify where there is a breakdown to get us to a point to be able to start to have those conversations, start to, to see where that disconnect is. It's definitely a but. Um, personally, I think we need to, as the CAO suggested, have a bigger discussion about how they fit into the organization. But we do have the motion on the floor, and this is just to develop a set of questions. Uh, and I'll call that question. All those in favor? We have one, two, three, maybe, okay. I'll count the ones that are opposed. Any opposed? We got Director Watt, Director Johansson, myself, Director Conans, Director McCordoff, Director Weeb, and Director Taylor. Oh gosh, am I missing any hands on the screen? That's close. Did you catch yeah, the numbers? I lost you after you. Okay, those opposed? <laughs> Director Campbell, Johansson, Pendergraft, Conans, McCordoff. Weeb and Taylor. So I only get seven opposed. So that motion carries. And that finishes that item on regards to the corporate business. No, that's where we would go. I'm saying on the organizational charts, CAO, there's nothing more on that? No, that was it, Mr. Chair. Okay, that takes us to item the corporate business plan, CAO. All right, so we talked about the 2022 business plan, and I gave you a summary of that. Uh, we've adopted the 2023 to 2026 strategic plan, which is the guiding principles. And now uh, we start to drill down as to what we're going to do in 2023 with uh, the specific 2023 business plan. So uh, this will be a similar format. I'm gonna work off of uh, just a couple pages in this, Mr. Chair, um, and just take you through it. This is at a, still at a draft stage, uh, always looking for input um, on this, but it should identify the major projects, the corporate projects uh, that we're looking at working on in 2023. So if you go to page 10, Danny, Oh, the one right after that uh, circle. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so same four key success drivers. Uh, the first one looking internally. So we're talking about within the organization and what we need to do uh, in order to um, move towards our goals in 2023. So we have four goals 
under high performing organization. The first one uh, is always about effective and fiscally responsible, which is important for an elected group of officials. Uh, the, the first objective under that is the financial management. And we have a specific set of performance indicators that we look at in order to uh, determine whether we're successful on, on that. Uh, always we're looking for an unqualified audit. Uh, you don't want to get qualifications on your audit uh, when they come in. It means you've done something wrong. Uh, so uh, we'll be getting the 2022 audit, uh, I think, in May this year. The budget, uh, always. Uh, we, have to, we have a legislative responsibility to submit a five-year rolling budget uh, to the province. So uh, I, we're in the process of that right now. Uh, you've given it first reading. We're for consultation. I believe Mr. Safino is going to be bringing that back at your next meeting uh, for a second reading and to make any amendments that he's identified uh, out of the consultation. We use this, uh, uh, and we had a discussion about what are the what really does this mean where we say 95% of established services. Um, uh, we still have those 166 different budgets, and our target, uh, I mean good estimating, a budget's only a plan, but good estimating, uh, you should be pretty close uh, to your budget. Uh, and if you're not, then that would indicate that there was some, either some uh, poor estimating or something uh, substantial happened during the year uh, that took you away from it. Uh, but there certainly shouldn't be any surprises. Uh, so uh, as a target, 95%, it's an arbitrary figure, but 95% seemed fair for us. Uh, and uh, that's what we strive to do. And then uh, the uh, manager of financial services will come in uh, at the end of the year and explain in his, uh, uh, from his evaluation as to where we ended up. I think uh, 2022 is around 92%. Um, and uh, then he would explain uh, why that happened. So, uh, but as a goal, 95% seemed reasonable for us. So we leave that in. We have to put some parameters around it. Uh, Director Barkwell uh, brought this up uh, during, uh, on January 19th. Uh, with regards to really what does that mean. So we'll put some parameters around it. Um, and I think either uh, is there a deficit or a surplus and how much, uh, like those types of parameters um, is what we want to look at. Uh, we're still, this was a carry forward, uh, developing a fees and charges policy to go along with the bylaw. So we'll work on that. Uh, and same with the reserves policy. Now that we've got one, uh, it's important that we continue to, um, make progress on that. Again, uh, most importantly, so that we have our share of any grants that we're going to be applying for uh, down the road. Uh, as far as effectiveness, uh, we've got asset management we're going to be working on uh, now that we've got the software. Uh, we, uh, we've got four audits that we want the uh, manager of financial services to do. We believe that there are some functions out there right now that may be more efficient to bring them in house. So he'll be looking at how much are we spending on things like uh, electricians or controls or um, uh, telecommunications, uh, those types of services to see if it might be more efficient if we can just hire uh, somebody in house that could do that. But we spend a lot of money uh, on consulting services right now that we think um, might be more efficiently done uh, by a different mechanism. So we got four identified that we're going to be looking at. Uh, so that'll come in sometime during 2023. Uh, our collective agreement expires at the end of 2023. Uh, I know Summerlin's just finished uh, successfully, so congratulations to them. Um, but for the majority of us, uh, other than Karameas, uh, the rest of us are in bargaining in uh, starting in 2023, right? Well, we'll get a notice to bargain uh, three months before the, exp the expiration of the year. I'm sure our, our uh, uh, bargaining agents are anxious to get at us. So uh, there's a lot of prep work that's done in order to get uh, ready for that. We'll come in for instructions probably in the fall uh, once we've got a, a platform uh, set for you. 
Supply chain management has been more of an issue. So as far as like the purchasing function and how we make sure that uh, we had a discussion about this at our CAO meeting last week, um, there's got to be opportunities for shared uh, purchasing. Uh, we identified a couple uh, that we're going to be pursuing on uh, pursuing, but um, the supply chain management uh, is an issue that we have to address. So we've got that in our plan for 2023. And then uh, we mentioned the lean methodology uh, processes. Uh, we have Ms. Morgan taking her green belt in uh, 2023. Uh, so we want to reintroduce uh, that. Our previous green belt, uh, Marnie Manders, uh, went over to Summerland. <laughs> so they, they stole our green belt. Um, but uh, we, we have some other processes that we think could benefit by this process mapping, these Kaizans. Uh, that come out of this type of an activity. So we're going to look at that again in 2023. I should, I, I'm being facetious. We do have a green belt left, but uh, we're, we're going to develop another one. <laughs> um, the second goal under a high performing organization is about health and safety. Uh, not only is there a regulatory requirement for this, but uh, any good employer is going to make sure that they keep their employees safe. Uh, so we measure how we're doing against, uh, we, this is an external benchmarking uh, through WorkSafe BC. Uh, they come out with classification uh, statistics every year. And so far uh, we've been below the average uh, for our classification. So. Uh, we want to keep working on that. And they have certain parameters that they measure on uh, for that. So it's, it's like one of those best employer programs where they have variables that you measure yourselves against and then benchmark with others. Uh, so we're going to use that. Uh, the other one we want to do, uh, we did participate in the Certificate of Recognition program back in 2010, 2011. Uh, this is where an external auditor comes in. Uh, and uh, does an audit on your organization based on criteria set by WorkSafe BC. Uh, it's over and above the, the uh, a platform for uh, regulation, but uh, it's, a, it's a good way of measuring how you're doing. So uh, we've got that planned for 2023 and there's a lot of prep work uh, to get the organization uh, ready for that. So that's on the plan. And then uh, our Workplace Health and Safety Committee uh, always develops an annual plan each year, setting out what they're going to do in the organization, uh, in addition to their day-to-day -day activities, doing the, the uh, workplace safety inspections and that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll implement that. Um, the third goal was uh, all around what we just talked about. It's uh, this organizational climate and uh, our uh, intention to keep going with that. So this is where we, uh, the board adopted those eight characteristics of high performing organizations back in 2008 that we've used since then. Uh, so this is our now 2023 program. Um, when I met with the 11, well, the 10 work units uh, this year, I, I'm, I'm always interested as to whether they see a value uh, in uh, participating and whether they wanted to again develop an employee organizational development committee or whether they want us to uh, just proceed with some of the corporate programs like customer service. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether we'll form a committee or whether we'll just pick out certain themes based on the, the statistical and qualitative analysis that we just got, um, but we'll, we'll do something uh, as far as an organizational development program. Staff retention has been on our plan for the last couple of years. Uh, we had the workshop uh, at, the, at one of our legislative workshops uh, with the board on that. And uh, HR has developed a staff uh, retention plan. And part of that, uh, and was when Ms. Morgan gets back, uh, she's on leave right now, but when she gets back, she'll be bringing in a report um, on staff retention, one of which is around the flexible workplace. Uh, there's lots of uh, municipalities now that are talking about uh, shorter work weeks or um, different flexibility parameters around work. Uh, so we'll be doing that uh, in 2023. Uh, this is our measure of organizational climate. We always want to see our measure our, uh, of climate go up. 
So that hopefully uh, this is the start of an upward trend line. Uh, so when we do the 2023 survey, we'll want to see those uh, marks higher. Uh, maybe that's what the board can do. You can put us over the top uh, with your high marks on the survey. Uh, you'll raise our, our average um, to keep the upward trend line going. And then uh, also uh, we have a rigorous uh, performance evaluation program or every employee in the organization gets a, a formal performance evaluation every year. Uh, and then for most of it, uh, they do updates on a quarterly basis. Uh, anybody that has a supervisory role, uh, we are always interested in how their employees rate them. So uh, we send out uh, 360 evaluations on all supervisors and that's taken into account in their performance review. So uh, this 360 uh, process is uh, takes a lot of organization for the HR staff to do. Um, and then the fourth goal on this is about IT. And uh, a couple of years ago, we added this goal um, because information technology has uh, plays such an important role in uh, keeping pace, but also uh, with um, all of the processes that we're doing. As I said, we're just in the transition, uh, moving on to uh, Microsoft 365, uh, which... I mean, everything that we do now is, is a change. Um, the whole thing about the telephone service and um, rural connectivity, I know is an issue for the board. So we've got that in the plan. Danny's gonna come in and give us a, a report on those, uh, on two issues around that shortly. Uh, and then also we have our ambassador program um, in here. I don't know why we got that in this one. Oh, no. We might move that one um, into the, the externally focused <laughs> um, key success driver. So uh, that is key success driver number one. And again, if there's any questions anybody has, um, Mr. Chair, just uh, interrupt. So the second key success driver is about customer experience and uh, providing service. So we have uh, two goals in this, four objectives. So the first one is about providing high level of customer service. Uh, and we have two objectives under that. The first one was about that issue of uh, really our citizens not understanding what we do. So uh, we tackle that uh, through a number of performance indicators. Um, we need to do a better job of promoting our facilities that are out there. Oftentimes we don't even sign them no wonder people don't know what we do. We don't put signs up uh, saying that this is a regional district uh, facility or program. So uh, we need to do that. And uh, we have our communications plan uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Thompson came in and introduced to committee uh, a while ago. Uh, a lot of that is around informing our citizens as to what we do, but there's a much bigger component uh, to communications. So uh, uh, we'll come in uh, every time we do our activity reports. Now you'll see that Christy has a communications plan uh, to bring in for an update as well. Uh, so we'll update the board on what we're doing with communications. We know that's important to you. Uh, this whole thing that's going to come out of our customer service program uh, that you, you just did with Tracy Lorenzen. Now it's into the policy development and the, the uh, standards and, and uh, uh, the follow-up as to how we go about and implement that. So that is on the plan. Voint alert, uh, we're gonna give you an update on on how we're uh, revitalizing that. And then also uh, in your uh, workshop that we did um, on December 8th, uh, to talk about strategic plan, is that when we did that? Uh, you mentioned that social media uh, was an issue for you. So we put that uh, onto your plan as well. As far as about uh, sort of the continuous improvement uh, aspect of it, this is where we wanna go out for our citizen satisfaction survey. And when we get those results, we'll do the correlation between staff perception and citizen perception, see if we've made any improvements and uh, then uh, we have a customer relations and experience committee 
and they develop a plan. So we'll uh, brief you on that on a quarterly basis. And uh, I, I keep expecting a report out on the Area D boundary uh, review. I know that you've been talking to the province about that. So that is on our uh, plan for 2023. I'm just not sure what it is. So uh, uh, well, we're all waiting in anticipation of what the results are. We meet next week on it again. So okay. we'll have a report after that. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to uh, investigate new platforms to improve uh, access and ease of use for the web page. And you brought that up at your workshop as well, is that we need to uh, revitalize our corporate web page so it's easier for people to find what they're looking for. Okay. And then the second goal uh, under uh, customer focus was um, this continuous improvement one. So this is where we look at, it's sort of, I'm not gonna call it red tape, but this is where we look at all of our policies and bylaws and uh, processes to uh, get rid of the redundancy and to make them as easy uh, to use as possible. So we've got a, a couple that are, uh, have been uh, specifically pointed out. One, uh, the whole invasive weed and pest issue, uh, that's where Lisa Scott came in and presented about what they do. It's a big program now and uh, as far as enforcement goes, uh, we've got a whole, uh, every electoral area has a different program. So we wanna look at whether there's a benefit to having a standardization of those um, and making sure that we're consistent. So we're, we're gonna work on that. Uh, the Clarity software uh, that we bought like four years ago, um, has taken a long time. And when we got it, we found out it didn't talk to our other programs, uh, our SharePoint, so, which is it's reliant on to share information. So uh, Danny's got that figured out and we've now implemented it for building inspection and enforcement. And then, uh, so we'll roll that out in 2023 and planning is next. And then uh, public works next after that. And okay. that, should make it easier for our citizens uh, in order to uh, work through the processes involved with that. We got a question from Director Monteith. Through the chair, can you remind me what that is? Clarity. Yeah, it started out as a basic gov uh, and then got bought out by Clarity. And uh, it's, it, uh, it puts everything uh, into the virtual framework. So you can uh, apply for a building permit or uh, you can, it, it it's automatically sends out letters or follow-ups to remind people if they're in contravention. Uh, it, it automizes all of the work that we do manually from a building inspection and uh, uh, bylaw enforcement perspective. And when it gets into planning, it's the same thing. It automatically sends out letters and notices and, and uh, follow up. It's a really a communication tool, but it's uh, very detailed. Okay. Uh, if you really want to know, ask Danny later on. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the expert. <laughs> yeah. Um, Right to enter. So the board raised this uh, year, a couple of years ago now, and we've had it on our plan. And then we've had some turnover uh, in the department, but uh, we know what the legislative provisions are for right to enter property. So it always says that uh, if we have a bylaw uh, that uh, requires enforcement, that the bylaw enforcement <laughs> officer has the right to enter. But uh, we get complaints if uh, we don't notify people first or, or how they go in or when they're taking pictures, people uh, get surprised by them. Um, so in addition to what the, what the legislation says, we wanted to do a more, a deeper dive into really what is uh, acceptable as far as right to enter. So that is what we've got on Mr. Petrie's plate uh, this year is to, uh, and the ombudsman has some good stuff and uh, there, there's lots of good information out there. Uh, we just haven't adopted it yet. So we, we wanna do that. 
So that's coming. And then uh, the business continuity plan uh, was adopted uh, for our corporate facility uh, five years or so ago now. Uh, so uh, Ms. Mullen is going to do an update on that. And then uh, the transit future plan is still uh, in progress. It's slowly moving along. They've done a, a really extensive consultation process. So uh, we're looking to that. But uh, really the one active pro, uh, project that we have outstanding is that is our uh, partnership with Princeton uh, to get uh, the bus from Princeton to Penticton. Uh, to make sure it's uh, a, a regional program rather than just a local. Okay. Okay. So that was it for key success driver number two. Key success driver number three is this one about community sustainability uh, and the three pillars of community sustainability. So on social sustainability, uh, this is where we include our regional emergency management program. And uh, the big project for this year is that study uh, that is ongoing now and the results that we'll get from that and then uh, what we want to do with it. Again, uh, this is, uh, I'm anticipating we're going to get some really good information. I know there's a good uptake on the survey that's out right now, the citizen uh, survey, and uh, we're just about to get out with our focus groups and our community engagements. Uh, so um, what we're really interested in is what our citizens want us to provide. We know what we provide based on the regional program. It's, it's really preparedness. We do training and exercising and coordination and uh, communication. Um, if there's a response required, uh, we don't budget for that. We just charge uh, our employee time back to their normal service. Anything overtime uh, is paid for by EMBC. Anything contractual is paid for by EMBC or uh, we have no mechanism to do it. Uh, we don't have a site presence for floods. Obviously, a BC wildfire is the site presence for fire. Um, but, uh, you know, we, it, it's going to be interesting as to what the expectations are out there and what the gap is. And then who pays for it? And it, do we need a new service uh, that just uh, is for the rural areas? So a lot of stuff uh, we're... Uh, uh, anticipating to come out of that. Um, yeah, we have identified in our emergency uh, management regulatory bylaw that our protective services committee is uh, the emergency organization. Uh, under, the, under the Emergency Program Act, every local government has to have an emergency or a management organization. So our Protective Services Committee is ours, uh, which is all of you. Uh, and then the CAO group is our emergency planning team uh, so that we have that coordinated uh, effect. So we want to make sure that we're engaging the CAO group and uh, Protective Services in the plan uh, make sure uh, that you're familiar with uh, um, what's in the plan, whether we need to do another hazard analysis based on the climate change, um, all of that sort of stuff. So we've got that in there. And I've got the uh, business plan duplicated, so I'll take that out. Uh, and you've told us uh, repeatedly and again uh, at your December workshop that communications is important in the emergency management uh, context. So uh, we've got that up for review in 2023 and we're going to keep building on it uh, and making sure that we're closing the gap on that as well. Uh, we've got parks under here. Uh, the Parks Trails Master Plan, I think, is prepared to come in next meeting uh, and present out on that. Uh, so the consultants will be in and they'll give you the results of their uh, regional Parks Trails Recreation Master Plan uh, results. And then we've got uh, some pending items where we're continuing to pursue uh, West Bench Elementary and continuing to pursue uh, the KBR Trail through West Bench. This uh, second goal, the one on economic sustainability, 
uh, this is where we've got that ESDP review. Uh, so uh, we decided that we were going to undertake a review of our environmentally sensitive development permit uh, structure. And then uh, the provincial and federal government came in and said, uh, uh, hold it, let's do a study on this. And the board agreed. Uh, so a committee was struck. And uh, I would hope uh, this year we get a report on that. Um, and uh, then you can determine what you want to do with it. But I wouldn't expect it soon. <laughs> they're, they're still predicting March, end of March. We'll see. Yeah. This year. <laughs> uh, and then our other long range planning programs uh, we have in, in economically sustainable too. So this is where we want to complete the regional growth strategy. We've got to complete area E. Um, this is the year out of your, <laughs> out of your 2021 strategic planning workshop with Gord McIntosh, you identified alternative housing as a project. And then, uh, we didn't have, uh, the opportunity to work it into the program, uh, in 2022. So it is definitely, uh, on the program for 2023. So that study will be underway. Um, we have completed the consolidated, Zoning Missing by law. Hand here. Oh, sorry, Director Gettins, you question? Yeah, through the chair. Sorry for interrupting, but I'm just curious about um, talking about the alternative um, housing and with Mark uh, Gord McIntosh, sorry, and going to have this upcoming strategic plan. So the outcomes that we we worked on in December that you had mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. plus the outcomes that we have from last year with Gord, and then we're going to do it again in a few weeks with him. How do we streamline everything? Like, is there things from this plan that will have to be dropped if we come up with the new strategic priorities in a few weeks? Is that kind of the goal to, what's the, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot on the table here and there's no way we can do it all. And then we're gonna have a session and, and get more new ideas. So how do we streamline this? See you. So what I would expect, uh, because again, uh, you're at a strategic level. So you're thinking big projects. Uh, big picture types of stuff uh, is that uh, what you identify in February uh, will be what you want to accomplish by the end of your term. And then once we get those, then we can start a preliminary investigation on them, get them ready for budget, and that you would start on those in 24. Okay. Okay. Just with an eye on time here, we've got quite a few things left on the agenda. 45 minutes left and we've still got Silga and a closed session. So are we gonna have to delay this one until a future time is my thought. Um, well, you tell me what you wanna do. Uh, uh, you've had a chance to look through it. We can simply talk about the ones that you wanna talk about uh, rather than go through it in detail. I think that uh, might be more efficient right now. Cause it'll come back again. Like this yeah. is just the draft and it's just committee. Okay. so. With that in mind, is there anything with that the board has read through on this that they want to get some clarification on or have a quick discussion about? Yeah, I don't think there's anything I really wanted uh, to dwell on. Uh, I think most of what you've identified uh, both through 2021 and, and your December workshop uh, we've captured. Okay. So I would go to Director Bloomfield. Thank you, and through the chair, and, and the, the question about temporary use permits uh, as a means of governance over business operations. Um, it, what's the pros and cons for setting up a business license process within the regional district? We, we don't have uh, enabling legislation to do that. I thought some regional districts do have business licenses. No, I think um, maybe central. You have to go to cabinet. So uh, I think there is one, and it might be central. I believe that's right. Uh, yeah. But so you, it can we be would done. have to, <laughs> it'd, be a, it'd be a change to our, our letters patent, yeah. Okay, anything further? Director Monteith? Uh, through the chair, at some point there was a motion to have a review done of the um, planning in Caledon of the small lots. And I don't see that on the plan for next year, for this year. 
see you. Yeah, so we've got an area structure plan on the planning. Uh, under this corporate business plan, each department has a department business plan. The area structure plan for Cleden is on that. Okay. Yeah, there'll be a bunch of those little items yeah. that are in the individual departments that are available. If you see want to talk to those department <laughs> managers and make sure you're on there, that's a good idea. Okay, we will move on on the agenda here. Uh, I'm going to hold the board action tracking off until we deal with the SILGA, sure. if that's okay. I think we do need to get that dealt with. So we'll move on to that one, the SILGA resolution, CAO. Okay, so we have a end of February deadline to get resolutions into uh, SILGA. So... Uh, when we first started on the process, uh, we had identified one, and I think we're up to 11 or 10 or something like that. Uh, so that's what we have on your agenda for today, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, I mean, we can wordsmith uh, still, but uh, the intent is, is to identify uh, and make sure that you want to send these to SILGA, which would then go to UBCM. And if we've got the right context uh, in the wording that we've produced, or if not, if we're if we're off, uh, give us a change of direction. Um, and certainly, if there are any more, there's still time. But we would like to uh, get close enough that we can uh, bring this forward to your meeting this afternoon uh, to to get the formal resolution to send resolutions to Silga. Okay, I think we do need to work through these probably one at a time and see if it's yeah. something we want to deal with or send on to Silga. And we have the first one up, it's resolution one, which is what you're seeing there. Okay, let me just get mine up here. Okay. Well, it, if you wanna, go ahead, uh, Director Johansson. I'll just add a couple comments. I did put this together for uh, Director Holmes um, one of the things that happened when PCNs were rolled out, there was no capital funding associated. As you see in <clears throat> phase two, there is capital funding available for Caramias, Princeton, Oliver, Suyas. Um, but the first phase, which was Summerland and Penticton, was let, left out. But as PCNs roll out and challenges with healthcare, and uh, there's more emphasis on team based healthcare, I think we need to find a way to circle back to communities that uh, were rolled out earlier with no capital funding. Um, I mentioned on a case by case basis, I think it's just isn't here's some money, do what you need to do with it. But th there should be an avenue to to put a case to the ministry and look for funding for uh, some team based healthcare facilities, a, a clinic in uh, in a municipal facility or a affordable housing facility. I can pass it over to Director Holmes if he has any additional comments, but that's the gist of it, getting the conversation started and look for some, looking for some funding. Okay. Director Holmes? Yeah, I, I'd say it's not just for me. <laughs> so basically what it comes down to, the way, the way it's set up now is unless you're a uh, interior health facility and designated a hospital, you can't get any capital funding for a primary care center. I mean, that's, and, and, and there are other models out there that you don't have to be an interior health facility, surely for primary tax as primary care. Is that, are we going to end up every, all primary care is going to be in a, in a IH facility? I, you know, I don't think that's necessarily the way we want to go, but there's no other way that um, to access um capital funding if unless it's it's being driven by interior health and so you know when it, it when the pcn model first started it was the government it was the government that provided uh the ministry provided funding directly for ponderosa to get the pcn up and going uh and then somewhere along the way I, it shift all shifted over to um the health authorities and i don't really know why and, and, but, um, um, you, you know, I, I just think we should make a statement that there's other options that the government should, should um, contribute to. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Director Johansson, and then I'm going to 
just to jump on what uh, Director Holmes said, I think we should probably remove Summerland from that because it is it is regional, but it is provincial as well. It's not just one community. Summerland happens to be someone right now that possibly has a business case that they could work forward with, but we should have it open to the whole region, um, which is what I think the resolutions need to be, not specific to one community. They're supposed to be regional, but go to Silga anyway. So, okay. So just uh, if there's somebody who doesn't want to see this go forward to Silga, raise your hand now. Otherwise, this is going to go on the list to potentially go to Silga this afternoon. All right. We'll move on to the next one. Resolution 2. Except, Director Conant? Except we're changing the name. Yeah, the name uh, Summerland is going to be removed off that to make it a regional thing. So resolution two is public hearing notice requirements. CAO, I think this comes more from staff than us. Is this not correct? It does. Yeah, this was one of the legislative changes that the province made with regards to public hearing uh, back in 2021 during the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, but the change they made with regards to public hearing uh, actually takes more administrative work than the, than the previous one that they were trying to fix. So uh, we're recommending they just take that section 467 out, Mr. Chair. Okay. So again, unless there's someone who doesn't think this should go to Silga. Director Roberts, go ahead. And my question would be, how does this or will it affect um, transparency in regards to these type of land use issues with the public. Um, I, I was trying to read through it and get a better understanding. I do understand that you know what was changed has caused issue, um, but you know I just want to know we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in regards to transparency and an ability for people to uh, connecting through OCPs, etc. Um, dealing with land use matters in their community. So if I could just have a little clarity on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. CAO, can you? So what they were trying to do, uh, they said, if you're making a zoning amendment that does not affect your official community plan, uh, then you don't have to do uh, the public hearing. And uh, we've used that uh, a number of times. But what you do have to do uh, is instead of doing the notification that you're um, making a zoning amendment, you have to notify the people that you're not making a zoning amendment. And the uh, bureaucracy uh, around that is more onerous than it was to do the initial notification. So that was the intent. They should just take that section out. If so, if it's, um, it, I mean, these are minor. So if you're doing a zoning amendment and it's not going to affect your OCP, you just, it's a rule uh, sort of thing. Uh, you still have to have the, the uh, uh, I mean, it still has to go through the typical board process. You notify people in a, you know, a certain area and all that sort of thing. You just don't have to have the hearing. Um, better to either just go back to the regular wording or take that out. Okay. Does that answer your question or give you clarity, Director Roberts? Okay. Seeing no other discussion on this one, it looks like we're okay with this one moving forward. Okay. Next one would be resolution three, which is whoa, invasive a little high there, I can't read the top of it, but invasive species amendment to the Weed Control Act. CAO, again, a little. This came out of our discussion with uh, Lisa Scott and she mentioned that uh, even though there's a list of invasive plants that are on that uh, schedule to the Weed Act, they don't restrict uh, merchants from selling uh, uh, restricted plants. So uh, we thought we'd send in a resolution saying they should change the regulation saying that uh, if it's a restricted plant, they shouldn't be selling them to unsuspecting homeowners. Okay. Director Gettins. 
Thank you to the chair. Um, thanks, Christy, because I know this was the lion's share with you and you did a great job. Um, I just wanted to share with the board too that Lisa, Christy and I have been sharing some emails and there's really interesting work going, other, going on in other regional districts as well. Um, Squamish Lillooet Regional District is um, having a similar conversation as this board. So I don't know if it makes sense to kind of partner up and if that'll make it stronger, like if we each go to our local government associations, but acknowledge that this is happening in other areas. I don't know. I don't know if that's a, a positive or not. Um, Lisa um, got off of a call because there's regional work um, around invasive species and there is provincial staff support and they are working towards an invasive species act. And this person that works for government says um, just to keep pushing this along because um, it, you know, it reminds the provincial government that's, that this is important. Um, and so to get TBC, if we can do that. So it seems like we're kind of getting on a bit of a momentum wave here. So I really would like to see this one go forward. And then Lisa also recommended, and just in light of what we will be working on in 2024, that Squamish and Lillooet, they've banned the sale of invasive plants and animals. And Lisa talked to us about this during the last term as well. And it's part of their local bylaw. So there's some interesting things that we can do here. So I would really like to see this one go to Silica. I think you're really close with the statement. Um, just looking for advice on whether we should look at partnering with Squamish Lillooet when we go to our local government associations. Well, they're not in our local government. They're not in our association, are they? Squamish no, but, I, but does it make sense if we go to Silicon and say this is also happening somewhere else and if we can both get this endorsed and then we join together, maybe go to UBCM well, they together? Would, they would both go to UBCM. Individually? Then, yes, that's okay. the way it would work right now. Okay. And then however they deal with it there it would be different. So, so if something was passed at Lillooet, Squam or the Squamish Lillooet RDOS provincially, then that would also impact us as well. Right. So that, that never happens. Like two regional districts don't ever work together on something. Because that might be forward, a gap. When they bring it forward, Mr. Chair, they just indicate who's in support. Mm -hmm. So you could have 10 local governments that are on the same issue and they just they okay. put somebody's resolution forward and they say supported by the yeah. list. Perfect. Thank you. OK, so unless there's a desire not to send this one. Uh, Director Coyne has his hand up. Director Coin had a hand. I'm not seeing it yeah. now. I was just Go saying, ahead. if send this send this through. Um, one of our executive members, Asoga, is from Lillooet, and she's on that in part of that whole regional district thing. And so they are part of a different uh, area association as well. So we can. I'll have that discussion with her at that time, and we can try to push it forward. Maybe we can get a joint. Um, if, if our board approves it, maybe we can get a joint approval from their board as well. Thank you, that's fantastic. Okay, so seeing no disagreement on sending this one, we'll move on to the next, resolution four, which is protection of trees. CAO, can you enlighten us? I believe us? this is uh, the director from electoral area E. Mr. Chair, I'm not sure what the provisions are for municipal governments with regards to trees, so I really can't speak to it. Okay. Was this one that you had asked for, Director Fidrigo? It was. Thank you, the Chair. Um, I wasn't prepared to speak to it, but I have um, some residents in our area that are concerned about the removal of the trees, mainly um, this kind of stems from the clear cutting that's been happening on... Um, on our hillside and so we have some residents that are particularly uh, interested in in what different types of bylaw protection there is for those removal okay hmm personally i have to say that i see director canodal's hand here but uh and director roberts i'll go to them first director canodal yeah i'm i'm a little troubled by this i know it's it's well intentioned but this can run in a lot of conflict in, in rural areas that are interface, uh, uh, non-agricultural farmland or lands that are, are necessary for access to areas. Um, it, it can cause a lot of problems on the larger air, acreages and the interfaces. So I, as I say, good intention, it can take us in a bad way, you know, just a flip in, in how we do our regulation. Thank you. Okay, Director Roberts. Yes, thank you uh, to the chair and you know follow up to uh, director Canodal. Um, I'm more concerned about the vagueness of it. I, I do understand where it's coming from. 
but you know you're looking at you know fire smart invasive small holdings versus large holdings timber values um you know dealing with the positives and negatives in regards to um embankments you know so it, it just it, it creates more questions than answers i i believe as it's written now i think it's something that maybe um you know needs to be sussed out a lot more thank you okay director bloomfield thank you through the chair and and so in, in a regional district, there's many different types of properties and, um, you know, some of them, yeah, they've asked it and they have a, a lot of trees on them. I mean, I've got a lot of trees on my property and, um, you know, and I've done fire smarting. And so, you know, having a, having a, a regulation, you know, stopping that would be, would be foolish really. But, uh, but that's not what this resolution says. This resolution is merely asking for the federal, uh, sorry, the provincial government to provide the regional districts the authority to create bylaws uh, to regulate um, what happens to trees on a on a property, and that, and I think it's then it's up to the regional district to to make the bylaw work for the different types of properties within that regional district. So, I think. You know, granting the regional district the power doesn't mean to say that this automatically, you know, limits on what you can do on every property. It's, it's just granting the regional district the power to do it. So I'd, I'd be quite happy to see this resolution go to civil go. Okay. Makes sense. Director Holmes? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what uh, regulatory power the municipalities do have over tree protection, but I do know that... Um, it does, you know, we we have no, it has no impact on us when we try to do fire smarting, uh, when we're trying to protect our agricultural land. I, I don't see the relevance there. I always, uh, I've always felt that the, on the board here, we, I've always heard that, um, that uh, the frustration that they, we don't have the same powers as municipalities. And so now <laughs> when you're proposing it, you're saying that you don't want it. So I, I don't quite get that. So I, I, I don't see uh, any harm in this at all. Okay. Am I missing a hand? I thought Director, hand, or Director Coyne had a hand up. Go ahead, Director Coyne, if you have something to add. No, that's okay. I'll just... <laughs> second, second thought or it was already covered so CAO uh, different train I'm, of thought I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure about for Mr. Chair but I think we might actually have to say what sections of the act we'd like them to discuss or amend uh, I don't know if they take a general yeah. statement some, some actual clarity on the numbers of what would need to change might be a little be a good idea there but Director Monteith, and then I'm going to ask the board here. So maybe we could have this resolution come back at the next board meeting, just so we can add those little bits of clarity. Because I don't know if we can do it in 20 minutes before the next, you know, yeah. before we bring it to the board meeting. But I don't want to lose the um, the meat of what we have here, because there is high value to this. So okay. yeah, maybe that would be my recommendation: is that we pull this yeah. and bring it back at the next meeting. So if the board's okay with that, unless there is someone opposed to that idea, I'll let that happen. Director Coyne, you have a hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you guys need, if if this is the way you want to go, it needs to be based on zoning or something because you can't just blanket the whole regional district. Um, I mean... It's not intended, but I mean, it could go very sideways if you don't have this very specifically worded that, you know, it's only in residential or, you know, a type of residential or something like that area, because you're going to try to use it to stop logging if that's the case. Um, just, I'm cautioning. Yeah, it's understandable, but I think Director Bloomfield made the point it would be up to the regional district as to where it would apply and in what zonings and everything else, and that can be dealt with. But I had another hand from, I think it was Director Holmes, and then... Yeah, I guess what we need to do is um, find out exactly what authorities the municipalities do have and and um, and, and figure out is that, well, what do we want, want the same or not? Yeah, as okay. simple as that. Director Roberts? 
Thank you to the chair. And then a follow up for um, Director Holmes. I wasn't, I'm not against this and not wanting it to happen. I'm just wanting more clarity. And I think it, it's come out in the discussions, the importance of maybe uh, wordsmithing and looking at it a little bit more. Because again, as um, stated by Director Coyne, I'm just kind of concerned, you know, where the boundaries are. And again, yes, we do have our own OCPs. We have zoning, we have those types of things. Just not sure whether or not that needs to be at least stated in the, the document itself. But um, thank you. And everybody's um, statements have been very helpful for clarity for me. Thank you. Okay. So we'll just hold this one off till this next board meeting, not, not today's. Next one on the agenda is five. Funding for rural and remote volunteer fire departments, pre-hospital care training and deployment. CAO, is this? Yeah, I think this is in regards to the uh, problems that BC Ambulance is having uh, with resourcing and getting to calls in a acceptable period of time. And that uh, they, it seems like the fire departments are able to get out to local areas uh, faster. So this would be a resolution going, saying that the province should train firefighters uh, in order to um, help them uh, satisfy the requirements when they get to a place. And then, um, and also dispatch them, which is a different matter. Yeah. Okay. Am I seeing a hand from Director Roberts? Go ahead. Thank you. And, and, and for clarity, again, it's, um, and I'd like to see it more like it's like funding support. And the idea is that we are already paying by, by providing first responding um, in some of our fire departments um, as it, that's been chosen. The other thing is that um, the training itself, those are things that are already out there to profess, but a lot of times, especially our smaller brigades. And I have a, a real um, concern about those communities and brigades that are equal to or greater than 20 minutes away uh, to a code three response, even if BC Ambulance is running at one at a hundred percent um, efficiency, the anarchists, the Headley, the East, the, the Eris, um, these are areas that again, call volumes make it impossible for them to be able to generate enough um, financial um, support to be able to maintain their, um, their training levels and be able to deploy. So again, uh, you know, I, I see it. It's not just saying that we're in charge of training, they, they have these training models, but we need financial support because the province, um, a part of this, as stated, is you know the downfall of the BC ambulance. We're not trying to replace BC ambulance. We're trying to support it at the same time, support our communities. And a lot of times that support puts us in um, a financial strait that the communities are unable to afford. So, so trying to find clarity. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sensing there's a need to revisit this one from a few members of the board. Is that the general consensus? Not a lot of head bobbing or nodding <laughs> here. <laughs> Director Taylor? So we have a problem. This speaks to part of it. I don't want to see our fire services just become the default uh, solution and we're paying them so that's okay. Um, if it's an ambulatory problem, then perhaps ambulance should be dealing with it. Yeah. Well, that's another issue in itself completely. Uh, if we get too well trained, trained they could do that. <laughs> That could be the trend from the provinces. Let them deal with it. But all right, I think we need to clarify this one a little bit more, so it won't be on this afternoon's docket unless someone says otherwise, or we can make a motion and deal with it there. So, we'll... was there something you wanted us to do with it, Mr. Chair? I didn't quite get any direction out of that. Yeah, 
I think we need clarity. I'm not sure who brought this mm -hmm. one forward. I think it might have been Director Canodal, but I'm, maybe it was Director Roberts. Uh, to the chair. Okay, yes, there's a couple convenient. there. Go ahead, Director it, Roberts, and then I'll go to Director Stringfellow. It was brought up by me. And again, the overarching concern is that we do have a need for first responders in, in rural remote. And, and that was kind of what my, the, kind of the principle behind it and being able to support these small departments that cannot afford um, what's really necessary in small communities that are outside of the reach of BCEHS in a timely manner. Um, again, not replacing BC Ambulance. And the first responder program, that level of training for an FR is not uh, um, a, a level of BCEHS. Plus under legislation, uh, fire departments are not allowed, but BCEHS <coughs> is allowed to transport patients. So it's not something that's all of a sudden we're going to take over for BC Ambulance. That would be a huge legislative change at uh, a provincial, provincial level. Okay, Director Stringfellow and then Director Gettins, and we'll move on here. Just for clarity, my understanding is that um, they're looking for funding to come not from the taxpayers, but because we already pay for health care, that they then refund the fire department for the cost of their services. Okay. So the actual call-out fees would be covered as well then is what you're suggesting happen in there. I'm not sure it's clear on that wording unless that's what's meant by deployment, funding for deployment. Uh, okay. Director Gettins? Thanks, Chair. Um, I like that clarification. I, I'd like to see this come back this afternoon. I think it's a, it's a good one. Okay. So maybe that's the only thing that needs to be clarified is by deployment, we don't mean just sending them out. We want it to say that they pay for that call out. Ah. Okay. So okay. if that could be tweaked, we'll have it back this afternoon. And if not, we'll get it at the next meeting. Resolution six. BC Transit Administration. I'll go so to the CAO. This is the one that we approached the minister about at UBCM in 2022. Uh, wasn't uh, really successful. Uh, this is where we're asking for the province to increase the rural uh, share through BC Transit, uh, just because we have uh, low volume of people and greater distances and and uh, uh, different than um, uh, municipal transit service. So we thought we'd put it forward as a SILGA resolution uh, to try again. Okay. So again, here, unless there's someone who's opposed to it. Sure. Yeah, Go thanks. ahead, Director so Gettins. Thanks, Chair. This is the same meeting that we had with BC Transit later, but there's been no follow-up or anything. So we're just going to give them another nudge. Well, well, you always get the letter back saying thanks, but uh, <laughs> that's it. yeah. Okay, because at that same meeting, she said that she was going to come back. I can't remember her name now. The, um, the woman we were talking to from BC Transit, she was supposed to be coming out here in the spring yeah. to see that. So, okay, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, yeah. it is. It, back. it yeah. is. Okay. Okay. So we're okay with that coming this afternoon. All right. Next one. This is. Looking like we're going to have an awful lot of resolutions at Silga again. <laughs> Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. I think I do know this one, but CAO? Yeah, this came out of your discussion uh, recently about putting the same rules uh, or some rules around uh, where a retail outlet uh, can uh, sell cannabis uh, in a community and then about the public notification uh, process for it. So uh, right now there's a, uh, a requirement for us to comment, uh, whereas with liquor establishments, uh, you don't have to comment. So we wanted the same provision uh, for cannabis. Okay, so this is to keep it consistent to the way we would be handling yeah. liquor licensing and cannabis licensing. I think that was the general idea from that last time this was discussed at committee so yeah. we'd like to just opt out yeah that's the way it's <laughs> worded okay 
I don't, unless someone has a different thought on it, we'll move that one forward. So let's go to eight. Holy gosh. ALC expansion of non-farm usage on farmland, CAO. Yeah, this is uh, Director Canodal, but from what I understand, this is uh, a concern that whereas wineries uh, can add certain commercial aspects to their business that uh, tree fruits uh, cannot, and it's a disadvantage to them uh, where they want to sell their, their products uh, on site. And uh, this is asking for really, uh, I, I think other farmers other than uh, vineyards and wineries to be able to do that. So with the vegetables and tree fruits. Yeah. So like bistros that are allowed on a winery could be elsewhere as well on those farms. Okay. So Director Monteith. Uh, through the chair, fully support this. Uh, we have a fruit stand who are, cannot seem to get a license or get their kitchen uh, approved so they can sell pies from their own vineyard, from their own orchard, right? So it makes no sense. So I fully agree. Yeah. Okay. So unless there's a reason not to send this one, we'll let it come this afternoon. Resolution nine, a one hectare policy for grant funding, CAO. Yeah, this is Director Canodal as well. And again, it's about alternative housing and the proliferation of uh, housing, um, more housing than is acceptable in some uh, uh, zones right now. And he's uh, proposing uh, that we ask the province to uh, either amend the policy or, or I think withdraw it because at this point in time, uh, if you're not on a community septic uh, wastewater treatment system, then you need a hectare of land in order to put a septic uh, field. And that is restrictive as far as this alternative housing goes. Yeah. You can do it on a smaller lot, but you just can't have more than one house at the moment. That's the, the densification ah. part. Director Monteith, and uh, then I'll... Through the chair. I guess I'm looking at some of the wording, like the 20 years old, and I don't know if Silga, um, other directors would have the same, I guess, read of that. It just makes it very targeted to one specific community. So I'm wondering if that should be um, looked at. That's just a whereas though, that's not the actual, the motion itself. Could we scroll that down so we can actually see the motion uh, rather than just the whereas's? Now, therefore, be it resolved. <clears throat> Director. Thank you, Johnson. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, is this similar to what we have in, in our own bylaws around secondary housing, being able to, to provide a, a secondary house on a piece of property uh, that you have to be connected to the community sewer, but if you if you expand that piece of property and you share a wall with the with the primary residence, you can connect into the sewer system. And I thought there was some some wording with OBWB about grants that you couldn't get if you did this. Like it seems, I, I'm confused because it seems to be in our own bylaws. Can you clarify, Chris? Um, well, I, I'm gonna apologize because I missed the first part of the question. I was just reading the uh, therefore resolved parts. And um, my understanding of the one hectare policy is that as it relates to the province, it's only applied at subdivision. Uh, so if we're asking the province to amend something, it's not, it, it's Okanagan Basin Water Board that applies it to additional housing. And that's their additional interpretation and application of the one hectare policy beyond what the province does. Um, so I'm not sure if the province would be able to respond to this specific resolution. To me, it seems more of an OBWB requirement. And they do, they do state that uh, secondary suites uh, can be added to a parcel less than one hectare on a septic system, but if it's a detached um, additional dwelling unit, then yes, it has to be on a community sewer system, and that that does relate to OBWB's uh, grant funding uh, resources. So, yeah. okay, oh, Director Bloomfield McCordoff, go ahead. And I see. Hi, and um, thank you through the chair. And uh, yeah, my understanding is that it's. It's not a provincial regulation on the one hectare minimum lot size for subdivision. It's uh, the Okanagan Water Basin Authority recommendation that the regional district has adopted because I don't think that regulation applies within the city of Penticton, which it would do if it was a provincial regulation. And 
you know, I, I there's certain things about this that, that I like. I mean, uh, but and I think that if if there's an ability within this um, within this motion to actually <laughs> do away with do away indirectly do away with community septic systems, I think that might be a benefit to the to this. But um, uh, that, yeah, I think I'm not sure that it's a provincial regulation in the first place. It is, but it's only it doesn't restrict the number of homes on that on the lot of one hectare when it's different though at the OBWB, but I'll go to Director McCordoff. Then. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think that OBWB is basing it on a, on a provincial ruling and Anna Warwick Sears is coming here at 1230. So my assumption is that maybe we could ask her about this specifically um, if there's some concerns, yeah. could we? Absolutely. When she's presenting, yeah, she's presenting at twelve thirty today. <laughs> Director Holmes. Um, yeah. So the OBWB uh, policy is being reviewed. That that whole one hectare thing is being reviewed currently by the OBWB. Um, and 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 as uh, Director McCordoff said, it 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 does come from some sort of provincial mandate or yeah. or, or something, which uh, I'm not really sure what that is, but. The same, this, my, my only concern with this is the same one as about with the tree, the tree one. I think we need to be specific and find out exactly uh, it, what it is the province uh, um, issue. What, what do we have an issue with in terms of uh, provincial policy or, or regulations or, or, or legislation? What it is we're asking to be changed? Because until we know that, you know, it, it's too vague. Well, I think uh, Chris is correct. The province isn't disallowing anything that we're asking, other than they're saying if you want to subdivide and you're on community septics or not community sewer, then you need to be one hectare. If you're on a sewer system, you can go smaller. If you're not, you got to be one hectare. That's all that their policy says. And personally, I don't think this is the right question that we should be sending. So I'll go to Director Knodel and then Director Federigo. Rick, go ahead. Uh, this is probably more a matter for clarification. Uh, at the last OBWB meeting, when this was brought up, uh, Dr. Sears uh, said it was provincial uh, um, policy and they couldn't uh, go against that. Um, but there seems to be uh, a little bit of confusion in that matter. So that's the direction I was trying to take with this is to, to clarify that direction, um, the concern was that overabundance of septics could cause uh, a, a deterioration of water quality. Um, <clears throat> since this law was designed, the septics have changed considerably. Uh, they're built differently. They're, they're handled uh, totally different than the original uh, thought. So we should be giving some thought to that. Um, moreover, it's uh, possibly rather than one hectare, we should be going to one acre. Uh, and that would help alleviate a lot of the problems. Right now, it's it, you can go ahead, but you hook the two septic services together. So you really, or, or the two, two units together. So you haven't really changed anything. You've just put more load on one septic service. It's still possible to get around it, not necessarily the best solution. So I, I was looking for clarification on where we could go. Secondly to all that, the actual uh, penalty for go do going against this is to withhold grant funding for uh, uh, services that would actually help alleviate the problem. So it, it just kind of seems like bringing your own bullet into your firing squad. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Director Federigo. <laughs> Thank you to the chair. So I'm currently taking a housing policy course and it was mentioned that the province is looking to bring in rulings in more of an urban area that will allow for three dwellings on a property to help increase that density. But they're looking at more of those urban air or those um, city sort of urban areas. So maybe if we're looking at the affordable housing piece and I apologize, I, I've got to find um, where this information is coming in, but maybe we can look at then asking the province to include rural areas in that in that 
where they're going with affordable housing in terms of having three households on one property. And maybe that might be a better approach than the one hectare policy if that's more an OVWB um, way of tackling this specific ask. Okay. I'll go to Director Barkwell and then I think we need to make a decision here. Go ahead. I'm really glad that Director Nodal's brought this up. It's, it's this one hectare for subdivision or additional residence is entirely arbitrary. Um, and, and as he said, the technology's changed uh, and even without change, the, we don't need to have such an arbitrary limit. Uh, it should be done on professional standards. So uh, whether the wording of this is exactly correct or deals with both of those things, at least it's bringing it to the attention of the province, hopefully. And, and I guess that they are having a review already, it just kind of reinforces that, that, that it's arbitrary and needs to change. Okay. Well, I don't see this one being quite ready for this afternoon, though. But uh, let's go ahead, Greg to Johansson. Sorry to jump in and extend the conversation, but I would like a little more information on this as well, because even our own policy is somewhat confusing. Whereas, if you attach the expansion to an existing dwelling, you can just connect into the existing sewer system. So, for 125 square meters. You can do that, but as soon as you detach it by even a foot, you have to be connected to community sewer. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And it's, and it's limiting the expansion of, of affordable housing on properties in South Okanagan, but it is tied to the grant funding. So it'd be interesting to have more, uh, more of a board discussion on this. <clears throat> I don't you. know there needs the board discussion, but this afternoon we can clarify that yeah. with the uh, Dr. Sears, and I think that's what we need to do. So maybe let's just hold this one off. If we do move it forward, we can do it at the second meeting in February. So is that okay? Seeing a general consensus on that, let's move on to the next one. If there is another one. What do we have? Hike and bike tenure. Thanks, Chris, Thanks, for the clarity on there. Well, this was from Director Knodel. Go ahead. Yeah, through the chair, this is an issue that's been going on for a number of years, but with a, a long discussion with Sino you know, yesterday, uh, we were nowhere near bringing this one to uh, to Silga, so I'll be standing down on this until we find out exactly what it is we need to apply for. Thank you. Okay, so this one's withdrawn at the moment. So we've got a number coming back to the board. Is there any that we're missing? Director Taylor? Uh, for further work, um, some of you may have read in the news yesterday, we have a individual released on bail into our community. High-risk um, drug trafficker um, released on bail with curfew, with a ankle bracelet. Um, we're 15 minutes from the police. I mean, obviously they travel faster than that, but uh, it, it seems to me that that might be a good location for the individual. He's staying with a family member, but if something goes wrong, I'm not sure that that's a good location for the police to be responding to. So can we write a letter urging the attorney general to caution the release on bail um, of high risk individuals in rural areas without resident police detachments? Yeah. Some kind of caution. Our judiciary works on <laughs> checks and balances. Yeah. I think I'm, that, looking, I'm looking for help. Yeah. I, think, I think that would probably need to come to a a notice of motion for the board here later today versus, I mean, we can have an initial discussion yeah. in, in here, but we're also running yeah. out of time nope. real quick. Fair so. Game. so I'm looking for direction and yeah. you guys are more experienced at yeah. this than me. Just tell me where and how to bring it forward. Yeah. Well, if you want to put something a little more specific together, it would be a notice of motion at today's board meeting uh, when those are called for, for notices of motion. Okay. So, okay. I think we're almost out of time here. We did have one item on in camera that we were supposed to go to. Can that 
be held off for a little while, CAO, or should we deal with it? And I don't know how urgent it was in your thought. Uh, we just need five minutes on it, Mr. Chair, but we could do it uh, at the board meeting. You could, we could go in and close at the end of the board meeting. We could do it at the end of the board meeting? Yep. Okay, so we'll just move that one to the regular board meeting agenda and deal with it then. So we've only missed the one item today. Board action tracker will have to come back in the future. Yeah, no rush on that one. Yeah. We'll do that time. And Director Knodel, go ahead. We're not hearing you. Struggling with you know it. Yeah, I, I put, a, put one in this morning. I don't know whether we want it. Can we do it now or do I have to wait for the next meeting or do a notice motion on it? It's another one to go to Silga you're talking about? Yes, sir. I think it would probably be best to put it on our next agenda for the second meeting, just because we're running short on time for one thing and, and not everybody's seen the proposed motion. It should come to the board so we can at least have a look at it. So we'll make sure it's on the next agenda. Thank you, Chair. Seeing no more, we'll look for a motion to adjourn. Moved, seconded, thank you. All in favor, great. Any opposed? Great, we're almost on time. Two minutes late only, wow. Not quite, and, and we were hoping we'd be done early. No. <laughs> Lunch is here, I suspect. So. What about the doors locked? Ah, well, we can, we, we can remedy that. <laughs>
WB update, and we should just turn it over to her, Madam Chair. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I'd had my mic off, so I'll uh, <laughs> do that again. Welcome, Dr. Warwick Sears. Thank you. Over to you. Okay, we practiced this yesterday, so hopefully it's working. Yeah, it looks good. We can see your screen and then the, um, the your slides and then the slides on the side as well. Okay, good. I'm going to switch to presenter mode then. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Oh, yeah. One moment. I want to. Yeah, uh, no worries. You just need to select duplicate on the menu you just were. There you are. Perfect. Yeah. Looks great. Oh, hang on. No, not on my end. <laughs> So now we can see you, but not the screen. Okay. Bear with me, please. That's okay. I'm trying to get rid of the presenter mode so I can see you at the same time as I see my screen. Because I like to see people when I'm talking to them. And Danny showed yeah. me how to do this yesterday. <laughs> Does that look okay to you on your end? Uh, I think so. Can you see me now? Can you see everything now? We can see your screen. Yeah. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, okay. So not quite uh, as I had intended, but this will be fine. Um, so I put together a presentation anticipating that a uh, number of the RDOS directors would be new. So those of you who have been on the board for a while will have a little bit of uh, refreshers, shall we say, but otherwise um, um, I have some new things in there as well. So the Okanagan Basin Water Board is um, local government agency is what we call it, local government watershed agency. And the um, purpose and the vision is to really all about um, sustainable water for the valley as a whole, for all the different uses that we might have. The, um, this issue of water in the valley is it requires a lot of management in part because it's so variable. So on this slide here, I'd like to use it on almost all my presentations. It's showing how uh, much the amount of water coming into the valley fluctuates from year to year. I just got this updated um, yesterday. So we, we now have the, the bar on the far right is um, all the way up to 2022. So you see, um, you can see all the variation. You can see, for example, it's interesting that um, uh, 2017, uh, though it was high water year, let's see, that would be 21, 20, 19, 18. This is 2017 is, is uh, not, not even as high as it was um, in 2020 for uh, the amount of water that came in and a, a lot of the flooding issues 2017 and 2018 had to do with the timing more than the absolute amount of water. So um, we are always kind of bouncing between surplus water and deficits of water. You see the three little bars over above where it says 1930, that was the drought of the 1930s and we have not had an occurrence like that since then but it's always something that we think about that even without climate change, we had that severe three year drought. And so we always like to try to be prepared for it. So the structure of the board, 
Uh, we have three directors from each of the three regional districts. Uh, we have one director from the Okanagan Nation Alliance, one director from the Water Supply Association of BC, which includes municipalities and improvement districts, irrigation districts. Um, very, you know, it's that other kind of layer in the Local Government Act that includes the improvement districts. And then one director from the Okanagan Water Stewardship Council. And the council is a um, uh, formally established in our letters patent uh, advisory group with um, volunteer members from uh, local municipalities, First Nations, uh, provincial agencies, federal agencies, groups like the BC Wildlife Federation or the Cattlemen's Association. So a really broad group of people that have an interest in water and that the purpose of the council is to discuss issues of the day and try and come up with ideas and potentially solutions that work across a lot of different interest groups and um, bring that information back to the board. And we have a small staff, which you can see here, the three gentlemen at the bottom are um, our full-time year-round milfoil control employees. So they're out working in the field right now, driving um, rototillers and um, keeping the lakes free from milfoil as best they can. And the rest of us are in the office. There's two of the staff are half-time and, and uh, four of us are full-time. So a pretty small group considering the uh, wide amount of things that we're involved in. This is just a picture of the council, just to give you an idea about what those meetings are like. These meetings are open to the public. So if anybody is ever in Kelowna on the second Thursday of the month, I encourage you to get in touch with us and we'll help you get to the meeting because it's very interesting for people to attend. Last, um, last month, we had a couple of newly elected officials attending just to get a sense about what it was like. The water board was established in 1970. Originally, it was uh, uh, the mayors and the valley had created the Okanagan Pollution Control Council to try and deal with um, sewage and septic pollution and that was causing algae blooms in the lakes. And, but they found that just as a loose association of mayors, they didn't have um, any, enough structure to be able to actually work together in dealing with water problems. There was no, um, you know, you have to have some kind of legal structure in order to do things. So they worked with um, the premier at the time, Premier Bennett was from Kelowna and there was a lot of change happening in governance in BC. Like this was right around the time, 1968, 69, 70, when the water board was forming, it was right around the time when a lot of the regional districts were being established. So it was considered to be, you know, not that unusual to form a partnership of the regional districts under this municipalities enabling and validating act legislation. And so that was how the water board came to be. It's the only one of its kind in British Columbia. And it is um, really uh, uh, structured to be a platform for collaboration. It's important to note that each director represents the entire valley. So uh, when our chair, Sue McCourtoff, is there, she's not there just um, defending the interests of the citizens of Osoyoos, but she's thinking about how uh, the issues in the entire valley um, are affecting all the residents, but bringing the perspective of people from Osoyoos and uh, their unique um, needs, given that they're at the receiving end of all of our water. They're, because of the difference in size of the jurisdictions, like, you know, municipalities as big as Kelowna and uh, some of the directors are from small electoral areas with low populations. It, it wouldn't work if we didn't have equally weighted votes and the equally weighted votes are also in the spirit of everyone representing the entire valley. And um, the 12 directors uh, vote on all different kinds of policy issues and the Water Supply Association of BC and Water Stewardship Council appointed directors they can vote on everything, but just not on things like budgets and contracts. So it keeps the um, financial decision-making in the hands
hands of um, elected uh, representatives. So the mandate is, uh, it's amazing how closely we still follow this mandate. It's very uh, broad with respect to just about anything that relates to water we're allowed to work on, but um, it's focused because it's, we're really just supposed to stay in the water. And um, the, the, there are much uh, more detailed ways of um, uh, describing these bullet points, but essentially, we, the water board staff and stewardship council uh, are looking at what problems there are around water and how those change over time and working together to establish priorities of things that could should be worked on. The, we have a mandate to communicate to other levels of government, both you know horizontally across between municipalities and regional districts, but also um, to senior government and uh, First Nations, there's, um, it's actually, we're actually, you know, um, allowed to lobby and advocate for things as well. And we do quite a bit of that. Uh, we can present recommendations to other levels of government or um, uh, local governments. We can organize and receive proposals and then participate financially in projects on behalf of the local government. So essentially what we are is we're, um, we're structured as a purse. The, the, there's a lot that's made of the OVWB being a watershed governance entity or something. But if you dive into our governance manual and it's there on the web, you'll see that it, we don't have authority for things. What we, what we have is we have the ability to pool funds from both from the regional tax base. Uh, we get a lot of grants from senior government and uh, we give out a lot of grants. So it's a, it's a way of managing funding and distributing it to uh, appropriate water um, projects. And we do a lot of other things to help get funding. We're involved with some um, uh, Canadian uh, level of uh, funding agencies and philanthropic organizations. So we're staying in touch with what the big major funders are doing. Um, it's also a BC group that we're very actively involved in. We try and stay in touch with these big funders because we want them to know what the issues are in the Okanagan and keep the Okanagan on their radar so that when RDOS or some uh, local water group wants to apply to the Real Estate Foundation or to you know, one of these other big um, philanthropic entities that, that they will get more attention. That's the, that's the philosophy behind it. And then creating a platform for joint initiatives. The best example of that was um, after 2017, the uh, RDOS, RDCO, and RDNO all pooled money that they got from um, the uh, 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 federal government, the, I'm trying to remember the, the acronym NDMP and um, the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. They pooled all that funding together and uh, created a pot of, plus some money that we got from uh, Emergency Management BC right to OBWB. It ended up having about $3 million to be able to spend on flood mapping. So just the fact that we're able, we're structured and able to pool that funding is a real advantage. So yeah, we're structured for collaboration. There's many different types of partners and supporters, and we have this joint capacity. So the water board staff are working um, across all these jurisdictions to help expand the capacity of local government staff. We have communication uh, programs and um, helping get everyone on the same page. I keep coming back to flooding lately, and I'll talk a lot more about flooding in the presentation. But um, for example, having um, trying to get everyone in the valley to have similar approach to floodplain zoning and the flood construction levels. And just, I think we are all stronger when we have more uniform policies like that. So over the 53 years of the water board, there have been three basic programs. The first is the sewage infrastructure grant program. This is the oldest, it's about 40 years old. What this is, it is a shared funding model so that 
every uh, homeowner in the valley pays into this, like they do into all the water board funding, just a certain cents per thousand uh, dollars assessment. It's pooled together. And then depending on who is doing the uh, sewage infrastructure upgrades, the funding will go to them. So um, right now there's a bunch of municipalities. Uh, there's uh, Summerland, RDOS, Osuyus, um, one other here that has a sewage grant fund that came from this pot of money that's put together by the all the regional districts. So that's the important thing about this is that it's a long ter term shared pooled funding among the local governments. And that is how it, um, it keeps going. It doesn't receive any money from um, the senior government. And we pay, I think it's 16% of uh, the costs of any infrastructure. The Eurasian Water Milfoil Program, I think everyone's pretty familiar with. This is in Basso Lake. We did, we were able to get in there and do a bunch of harvesting last summer, which was terrific. First time in a long time where uh, we've had a lot of struggles with um, the provincial uh, regulators. Trying, We're trying to um, make our permitting a little bit easier and more straightforward and be able to get into more places where the weeds are growing. And uh, this has been a long-term effort. We are now lately getting uh, support unusually from Department of Fit Fisheries and Oceans because uh, the DFO staff are uh, coming to the conclusion that the milfoil itself, as it rots and decomposes, it causes a hazard to the native fishes and the native Rocky Mountain Ridge mussels. So uh, we're starting to get help from uh, the federal staff to help intervene with the provincial staff who, who've been wanting to have us shrink our program. And then the water management program is the one that people are most familiar with because it has a lot to do with communications, the big water science projects that are underway. And so there's a whole bunch of different ones, everyone, everywhere from the don't move a muscle program to, um, uh, the hydrometric monitoring is quite a big program that's growing right now, establishing stream flow monitoring stations. It's a lot of work that's always underway with source protection, um, the um, uh, uh, Make Water Work outreach program, and uh, a lot of different kinds of projects. So for many years, when I started here in 2006, almost all of the emphasis was on drought. There had been a lot of different uh, projects that had started after the fire of 2003 in Kelowna and the big drought that was going on there then. And uh, so there was a lot of people were interested at the provincial and federal level at looking at what the water demand was, what is the climate projection for uh, further um, uh, demand for water, how are we going to manage if, you know, the drought gets much more severe. I have this picture here, even though it's Lake Mead, but just um, to clarify, like uh, Lake Mead is, a, is an actual reservoir and the Okanagan Lake is not likely to get drawn down like this. But this was this picture, I use this picture because this is kind of the example that people talk about when they think about drought and Okanagan and uh, how we're comparable to what's happening in the Western states. So um, this is kind of the most extreme example that people have. This picture was actually, I, I think I took it from a New York Times article in 2010, and I should update it because that bathtub ring is much higher right now. It's a really extreme situation on the Colorado River. But the point here is that we are really focusing on drought water conservation for, you know, the first oh, large number of years that I was here. But then in 2017, this is the park near my house in Kelowna, we had this incredibly high water um, experience. And th since then, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on um, how to adapt to flooding and deal with flooding and make preparations for flooding. Um, 
we're way behind in this uh, in a number of different ways, which I hope I can explain. So the big issue with 2017, you saw on that first graph that it was not an unusually high water year. The problem was the timing of when the water came and what was happening with the snowpack at that time. Around uh, this time of year in 2017, the snowpack was very, really low. It was about 80%. Sean here, or Sean, I use this picture of him. He operates a dam. He, he was following the operational protocol, which is when the, the snowpack is low, he is supposed to hold water in the lake so that um, it reduces the risk of water shortages. Because as I said, we'd all been focusing on drought. It's high priority to reduce the risk of water shortages because you know, you'd never know when it's going to be at the next three-year drought. But then what happened, this is his slide. You can see the dark lines there are the average over time of what the inflows are to Okan Okanagan Lake. And then the blue lines are, are actually like what happened. So you could see that it was double the average the amount of inflows that we got. It was really low. Um, at the beginning of the year, there was very little snowpack, as I said, but then it just started raining and we had rain on snow events. We had a, a ridiculous amount of precipitation through April and May. And um, we got this really big spike and he kept trying to push water out of the lake as quickly as he could but he can only release about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half of water um, uh, for the depth of the Okanagan Lake. And, and even then he was on the verge of like, um, he went ab above the, what is considered the safe amount of releases for the river channel going through Penticton. So he just pushed it as hard as he could um, with the amount of water that was being released and still the lake was, you know, it's, see, it says at the bottom of the slide, lake outfalls max, outflows maximized at 11 to 12 centimeters per week. So he just, it was like this inexorable, uh, raising of the water. I, um, I have put these slides in here, um, of different communities in RDOS. So, <clears throat> As an outcome of 2017, what we did is we did this very large flood mapping project for all of the main stem lakes at the bottom of the valley. And um, it, it was a huge exercise. As I said, it cost like over $3 million. We did it state of the art work. But when, it, when they were going through it, um, they warned us that the, under the current operations, the flooding was going to be really quite extreme. So they said, you know, the province is going to have to change how they're operating the dam because the floods are going to be much higher than um, people can really handle. So this that I'm showing you right now, they, there's two different versions of the maps. One is what they call the recommended design flood, which is a terrible name. But basically what they're saying is that they recommend that the province changes their operations, draws down the lake earlier in the year to accommodate more flood water. If the province does not do that, then this is the kind of flooding that you get. This is called the current, current operating plan uh, flood that um, this is gonna be the, like the one in 200 year flood in 2050. It, this is what they're asking communities to design around. So this um, this is in uh, Summerland, Trout Creek. Um, this is um, Skaha, north end of Skaha Lake in the um, south end of Penticton. Uh, this is Oliver. And this is a Soyuz. And I didn't zoom in so much on a Soyuz because I wanted to show that north end of a Soyuz where they have that wetland, giant wetland that people are always trying to build developments on. Just, it, it's like this huge amount of uh, flood risk in that um, north end of Osiris Lake. So the challenge is like, how do we avoid that? How do we get the province to change their operating plan so that um, we are have better protection from flooding 
while not at the same time opening us up for more risk of drought. So um, the Water Board worked together with the uh, province, with Sean Reimer, to create this plan of study. So there's 18 different studies that we need to do in order to get prepared to change how they operate the lake. And a bunch of these are already underway, but um, some of them we can do, some of them the province has to do, some of them the Okanagan Nation Alliance has to do because they have to do with fisheries. So basically there's a bunch of different choices to make. There's the, you know, the, the, the flooding around the lakeshore choice, which is kind of like the status quo, higher risk for that. Um, this is a picture taken in Grand Forks where um, they essentially had to buy out all of these properties and turn the area into a big park because there was no way that they could afford to protect this particular neighborhood from flooding. Um, there's the issues with um, increased level of drought and water shortages that people are concerned about because you never know what's going to happen next whether it's going to be a dry year or a wet year. And then there's the issues with the um, salmon populations that the ONA is trying to uh, restore. If you draw down the lake in the winter, there's um, you could potentially um, desiccate the uh, kokanee eggs that are uh, uh, laid along the shoreline. And if you don't draw down the lake and there's a lot of water coming in and you have to push the water out the channel, then you can scour out the eggs in the channel. So there's a lot of different issues going on here uh, between the uh, where it's going to flood, when it's going to flood, how <laughs> prone are we to floods versus drought, and how we're going to manage the fisheries. That's why it takes 18 studies and maybe you know another five years to even get to the point where we can sit down and talk about how they should change operating the dam. And then I just put this up here because that um, the flood that happened in the Similkameen last year, this is the Similkameen River and showing that peak event that happened in uh, late November of 2021. It, I found it really shocking and horrifying and spent a lot of time glued to the news trying to figure out what was going on during that. And it, it just emphasized how challenging this is and how nobody in British Columbia is really ready for um, these kind of extreme events that we're experiencing from climate change. Um, I'm, I'm making this whole thing an emphasis in my talk here because this is, I think, the biggest issue that we have in the valley right now is this issue with uh, lake level management and flooding and how we're going to manage it. So that's my slideshow. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm just taking a look around the board. Yep, go ahead, Director Bloomfield. Uh, thank you. And uh, through the chair, um, Anna, the, uh, the dam at Penticton, yes. um, yeah. can you update us on what the status is of that? Uh, I understand it's been uh, recommended for renewal. Yeah, so this is one of the studies that's in the plan of study um that dam was built in the 1950s and um now it's the 2020s uh normal um infrastructure life uh this would be about around the time when it would be engineers would recommend that dam being replaced the flood studies that we did uh found that it was uh undersized given the um the anticipated water that we're going to get. Um, I didn't show the flooding on the north end of Penticton because the way that when they did the flood maps, they said, um, we're going to put in, uh, in, <laughs> in the map, we're going to put in a, 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 a row of sandbags. We're just going to say that Penticton is going to be protected by sandbags from the north end because um, otherwise, uh, the the amount of water that was in the lake in the in the model would have flowed around the side of the dam and washed it out and caused really bad flooding downstream. So it's um, artificially Penticton is artificially protected in the flood map on the north end. I mean, the, the, basically, the dam needs to be bigger, um, stronger, needs to have more operating um, room and um, 
that will help with uh, overall control of the river channel and the, and the lake levels. But it, this is not an area of my expertise. This is what is uh, came out in, um, in the flood studies. Thanks. So as a quick follow-up, what would be the process then of, you know, following up on that? How, how, do, you, how do you go to the next step? So what happens is the provincial government needs to do a series of engineering studies. It is their dam, they own it. Um, and they, my understanding, the last time I talked to Sean Reimer, which was in the uh, autumn of 2022, is that he was working on doing some preliminary uh, work on that. They need to do preliminary work and then they would need to do a full scale like design and engineering study to, um, to, to figure out what, what to build and how to build it there. It, it's a major, you know, multi-million dollar project to replace a dam like that. And uh, it is, you know, we, we are, um, we're in touch with them, but it would not hurt at all to have uh, the city of Penticton um, have, having those conversations with him as well. And uh, the Ministry of Forests in general about, about that dam. Thanks. Anything else? No. Okay, I'll go. Okay, thanks. Uh, Director Coyne, please. Hey, um, so I've seen some preliminary information on the Similkamine stuff, and I know you guys have been working with our engineers on that. Um, is there any possibility that the Okanagan could see something similar to what we had happen, or is that just going to be kind of our side of the mountain that's going to take the brunt of it? Because the the data that we're receiving over the next what do they say 200 years like it's absolutely mind-boggling and we can't speak about it yet because it hasn't been presented but you know if that was to happen in the okanagan i mean forget what happened to us it's like it's it's horrible so even what we happened to us i mean if that happened in the okanagan we would see pretty much all of penticton underwater right so is there contingencies planning you know is that being taken into consideration well um that's a great question um i have to say i have followed you and your activities there in princeton and i really uh commend you for being a great leader there uh, i have seen that study that came out recently um for review because we were involved not the water board wasn't involved in that study, but because um, Director McCortoff and I are both on the uh, Osoyoos Lake Board of Control and the Board of Control contributed some of the um, background to that study. We're invited to review it before it came out. And it is, it is quite dramatic. It was dramatic what happened and the um, uh, flood forecasting is quite dramatic. I think there is a difference in the Okanagan uh, main stem because we do have uh, a bigger holding capacity in the Okanagan Lake and the main stem lakes. It's kind of like a big slow emergency as the lake level kind of goes up slowly and there's a bit more chance to respond to it. I think if there was gonna be something analogous that would happen in the Okanagan, it would be Mission Creek or one of the other uh, creeks that runs through a municipality and you know if the, a storm cell formed above um, say we had a big snowpack uh, above Mission Creek and we had a big warm weather event and we got a lot of unexpected rain then we could you know potentially have a Mission Creek flood in throughout Kelowna. The, the, the flood in 2018 actually that hit the South Okanagan harder than the North Okanagan, a lot of that had to do with extreme precipitation, lots of snow, and n really no way to control those streams that were coming in south of Penticton into the Okanagan River Channel. That's why there was so much flooding on the roads and things like that. But you could have something like that even bigger. The, the difference with the Similkameen, of course, is you have that coastal range and the Tulamine that is got different types of wet weather systems and wetter weather systems coming in. But I am not, um, I am not 
being, uh, uh, I don't want to underestimate the risk of flooding from streams in the Okanagan either, because flooding does happen on streams. You think about Kelowna, I'm just looking outside, I'm looking at the alluvial fan that Kelowna is built on, it's big and flat. This this alluvial fan was built by Mission Creek flooding over the years, moving around in a channel back and forth. That's what streams do. That's why Penticton's all nice and flat too, from Ellis Creek and Penticton Creek. And, you know, sometimes there's going to be uh, big water events. And so we need to all be as prepared about that as possible. Get those flood studies done on the different streams. Uh, City of Vernon has done a great job on this lately, but um, there's a lot more work to do in general. Okay. Thank Thanks. Um, I'm going to go over to Director Roberts and then I'm going to just, I want to, we've only got a few more minutes left, but I do want to follow up on our question from this morning's committee meeting. So, Director Roberts, please. Thank you, to the Chair. And just to follow up from Director Coyne, um, question in regards to unmitigated flow rates from the Similkameen, how much pressure does that put on the south of the Okanagan? as it comes in below um, across the border there. Thank you. The, um, the Similkameen River ran, um, forced the water back north into a Soyuz Lake in that um, rain event of um, November, 2021. So the, the, you can see that the some dirty Similkameen water was pushing north up into Okanagan Lake that the last time that happened, my understanding was like in the 1970s. So it's possible. Uh, it does create problems with Osoyoos Lake because Osoyoos Lake can no longer drain when you have a, a heavy flow on the Similkameen. But um, it's it's kind of concentrated in that one region rather than heading too far north up up the Okanagan system. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Um, we had a, a discussion this morning around the one hectare policy, but I'm gonna hand this over to Director McCordoff so she can ask the questions we're looking for. Great, thank you. Um, Anna, we were talking this morning about the one hectare policy, which I know you're quite familiar with. And partly it's because we're trying to look at densification of properties, uh, particularly agricultural rural properties, in order to look at housing needs. And so I know that the OBWB has a policy um, that you do not give out grants to um, people that are not following this. And it is a provincial policy. Can you just explain that a little bit? Because we did have a chat about it this morning and we agreed to ask you. Yeah, so um, thanks to Christy Malden. She did give me a heads up, so I did a little bit of thinking about it. The, and I have a lot of old letters and materials that um, uh, were, were guidance from the provincial government. I also um, sent a question to uh, a contact that I have in the infrastructure finance branch about this. The, the province did a study in the 2000s looking at where the pollution was coming from. And a, a lot of pollution was coming from failed septic systems. And they felt like they were, uh, on one hand, giving out uh, grants to have people upgrade, but then uh, then the communities were going and putting in more septic systems, the septic systems were failing, and then the province would have to give out more grants to fix the failing septic systems. So they felt like it was like some kind of a treadmill wasn't working. They did a big study and identified that the one hectare was the appropriate um, size that would provide more protection. And that's when they put it into the, it's a policy that is within their infrastructure finance group in order to receive those large infrastructure grants. So that's where the basic policy came from. Um, and then the, the, OBWB mir mirrored their policy in our policy. Great, thank you. Did, did you have a question? Yep, I've got a follow up here from Director Pendergrass. Oh, I, I have one more thing. Uh, the, the issue, because sure. um, Chrissy did send me the wording of the um, thing that you were discussing. The issue is not the technology of septic systems. 
The issue is maintenance and compliance and how there is there are very few structures anywhere, either at the local government level or the provincial level, of people following up, making sure that those septic systems are maintained and um, you know, issuing tickets or doing things that compel people to pump bad septic systems, replace failing septic systems or anything like that. The, the technology of a, of a septic tank is pretty basic, but it is, the, it is how they are used and maintained over time that is one of the biggest issues. Great, thanks for that. Uh, Director Pendergraf? Yeah, thank you. In regards to that one hectare policy, I guess the, the issue from the regional district's perspective is, is that we don't think that the OBWB's policy is mirroring the provinces. That's where the issue is, is the, the province applies it to subdivision. So you can't subdivide anything smaller than one hectare if you're on a septic system. Your policy is preventing us from adding a second home or dwelling, we call it an accessory dwelling, a carriage house onto that one hectare property. That's where the, the difference is. And that's what we've asked in the past from this board is to have that reviewed. And I don't believe that's happened yet. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan to review that? We are reviewing it. We're reviewing that whole policy, actually the whole program we're reviewing it. We're looking at where the capacity needs are, how to clarify what our policies are, how to make them fair across all the different jurisdictions in which they are. The, um, I remember when we um, put in the rule about secondary suites and carriage houses, it, was, it had to do with the size and capacity of, it's not, it, it is, it's sort of like a de facto subdivision rather than an actual subdivision because you can have uh, two residences on one lot which are um, you know, basically full-size houses, or you could have two families in them. With the secondary suites, which is allowed under our policy, it's you, you. One imagines it as a smaller dwelling, less people, easier to fit into the capacity of a normal uh, single-family home septic system. But uh, we are uh, working on doing this review. We have people from Interior Health. We have people from the local government planning departments and uh, from the Ministry of Environment involved in the steering committee to try and make sure that what we're doing is makes sense. And um, I just have to emphasize again that, that the, the water board's program is uh, has to do with maintaining buy-in from all the different jurisdictions in the valley. And, and the risk is if we, we make it too loose, then a uh, uh, jurisdiction like the city of Kelowna, which, which provides more than half of the funding, mm -hmm. is going to potentially not be happy about um, continuing. So we want to make sure that the program itself is protected over time that people are able to continue to access these grants. The shared funding model has worked well over time, but it's worked well because everyone has agreed on the ground rules and uh, uh, therefore said that yes, because we agree, we're all going to continue to pay into it. And you've got to follow up, and we're just at time, so yeah. quick follow up, please. Just a quick follow up is is we can send you some more info on what we were requesting, but in a nutshell, you allow a, a, a what do you call it an in law suite of yeah. a certain size. If we were to do that exact same size, but as an accessory dwelling, it said no, you can't do that. Even if you're connecting to the same septic system. That's where we're having the issue. Uh, so we'll send you some follow up on it. I don't want to go into it and, and waste a whole bunch more time, but thank you. We'll get it to you. We, we appreciate that. And we are very open to input on this. We're just opening up the review right now. And we want to have as much feedback from communities as possible about what issues they're having and what solutions that uh, people like yourself suggest. 
Thank you, Dr. Warwick Sears. I don't see any more questions from the board and we are at time. So thank you very much for coming. Your presentation is always great. Will we be able to get a copy of the presentation? Uh, yeah, I already sent it to Danny. So it, okay. you have a PDF of that. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, so with that, I'll get a motion to adjourn, please. And thank seconded. You. Thanks so much, doctor. And any, oh, who's in favor of adjourning? Great. Anybody <laughs> opposed? Fantastic. Over to you, Chair. Thank you, Director Gettins. We will move straight into the Regional District Okanagan Smoke Mean regular board meeting. We have before us the proposed agenda. There's a couple of additions, or one addition and one deletion from the agenda. The, we're going to add the in-camera from this morning's uh, Corporate Services Committee to the end of Legislative Services. I believe that will go to D4. And we were also going to be removing C2 at the request of the applicant. And that will come back at a future meeting in March. And the next thing I'm going to ask or remind folks is if you have something to remove from the consent agenda, this is the time to do that. And I believe Director Taylor has something he wanted to remove. So go ahead. Yeah. Can we remove uh, A1.1.1? Okay. Um, okay. We can discuss it at the time when we come to it in the regular agenda, and that will go to D3, just so everybody's aware of that. Anything else to remove from the consent? Don't see any hands on screen. So looking for a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Moved, seconded, thank you. All those in favor? Great, any opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to the consent agenda, corporate issues. Looking for a motion to adopt that. Moved, seconded, thank you. All those in favor? Great, any opposed? Motion carries. Down to consent agenda, development services. Looking for a motion on that one. Moved, seconded, thank you. All those in favor? Perfect, any opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to development services, or no, actually, building inspection, B, B1, CAO. Over to you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So in November of 2009, we had an application for a farm permit exemption um, on, uh, which property is this, uh, 3574 Fruitvale Way in area C and it was for the purpose of building a farm storage uh, shop building uh, which uh, fit within the exemption uh, requirements and uh, in that way it's excluded from any sort of inspection or um, uh, oversight from the regional district and then in uh, 2021 uh, the building official uh, out in that area saw that there was uh, an addition um, being done uh, on that same property. And uh, uh, when looking further at it, uh, it was uh, deemed to be a washroom that was going on to the farm building. And then further inspection uh, noticed that there were, uh, had been some uh, renovations onto the building itself as far as uh, changing them into uh, dwellings, both the, the first and second floors uh, that had been converted. So uh, that then uh, activates us and a stop work order was sent out and uh, notice of contravention and uh, discussions uh, with the property owner and uh, uh, no uh, mitigation activities had been undertaken. So... Um, with that, uh, our concern uh, is from the safety point of view and that there is now a residence uh, occupied uh, without building inspections and without sewerage records. So uh, we are looking for a notice on title and injunctive action to be commenced, um, Mr. Chair. Okay, if memory serves me right, we had started to deal with this one at the last meeting. No, and that was the adjacent property at 3548. Oh, okay, so it's a different property then? Yeah. Completely? Uh, we didn't defer the last one. We just added a, a condition on it that it be brought to the back to the board prior to 
uh, okay. uh, mitigation. So, that, so this is a separate property then, just so everybody's clear on it. it okay. Is. Looking for direction. Director Canodal, is this one in your area? So move the administrative recommendation. Okay. So you're moving as, as recommended. Is there a seconder for that? The motion is seconded. Generally, in these situations, we do ask or allow the property owner or their agent to speak to it. I'm assuming that some folks are here to do that. So please, if you'd come up to the table there and If you could remind us your name and introduce uh, yourself, please. And hello. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Jesse Parsons, and I'm the admin operations assistant at Gold Hill Winery. Okay. Um, so for this building, um, it was converted into it was it, it was it is partly a storage for farm equipment, as well as this is where our foreign workers are residing. I do have here with me um, home inspections from. Uh, a qualified inspector that we work with for our um, LMIA. So it, it is up to safety codes. There are fire alarms, extinguishers, everything. I mean, they are very strict when it comes to the foreign workers living in, in the home. Um, so I do have that. Although I know we don't have the building permits, and I know that is what needs to be required for moving forward with the house, but um, it is in safe living conditions. Okay. Have anything further to add to it, or I will go to the board for any questions they might have on this specific property. Go ahead, Director Gettins, and then I'll go to Director Holmes. Thank you. I'm not sure if it's a question for um, um, the, the person that's here, but when the home is inspected by this federal program, are they not looking for compliance with the local government as well, like the proper zoning in place? I don't know about that, but go ahead. They aren't. Um, as long as it's in safe living conditions then and it meets all the requirements, they don't know what what is going on with the RDOS. Yeah. They don't ask for building permits as long as it meets their requirements for safe living conditions, then it's acceptable. Okay. Director Holmes. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Director Knodel, go ahead. I'm just again wondering how this one slipped by uh, adherence to building permits is not uh, a new concept, so it's, it's this seems to be too a, a cut from the same piece of pie, if you will. Just a little concerned about how that unfolded. I'm not sure if she can answer that, but <laughs> I I can answer that. I don't know how it got how it slipped through. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how I, I, the building was existing, and then they renovated the inside. It was a start. Uh, it was a storage, um, and it is still storage for farm equipment. Um, there are two floors, and the lower floor um, half of it is for foreign workers, and the other half is um, farm equipment. Okay, thank you. Not seeing any other hands for questions, so we thank you for the presentation. We'll take it back to the board. And I don't know if this makes a difference, but. Um, we do have 125 acres, and so we do. We have foreign workers um, arriving next next week, actually. Um, and without them, we wouldn't be a viable farm because uh, pre-COVID, there were many farms in the Okanagan that didn't receive their foreign workers because. People didn't have proper vaccinations, or I, I don't even know if vaccinations was the issue at that time, but just they couldn't get here. Yeah. And so farms or wineries or farms um, put it out to all their employees that they would pay them their same salary at that time to work in the vineyard. And even applying for, like, we have to prove that we've um, had Canadian workers 
for the farm. And I can tell you, we don't get any applicants for, for uh, labor in the farm because it is, it's difficult work and, and Canadians don't want to, to do it. It's, it's just too hard. And, and even with the workers at the winery before, they would last maybe a week. And it, the conditions are, are tough. Thank you for that. We'll put it back to the board. We do have the motion on the floor. We'll deal with it. And thanks again for your little presentation on it. So we do have the motion on the floor. We'll go to discussion on that. Any discussion on it? Director Bloomfield, go ahead. Thank you, and through the chair, and I wonder if uh, uh, Development Services can just explain to us what uh, Section 302 means and to the property and what injunctive action might look like after July 15th. Do that. It's a notice on title. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Petrie. Uh, yeah, so the, the section 302, we put a notice on title. So if the farm or property did get sold, any potential purchaser would uh, uh, be aware that there's a potential violation to uh, some regulatory requirements. Um, and then injunctive action, we would seek a court order to order them to uh, make them comply with their regulations, so to bring it into compliance. And that would be everything from the building permit requirements, which would also catch the zoning, and then septic as well. So, yeah. Follow-up? Go ahead. Thank you. Just, yeah. And so if... Um if, if a, a, a permit was applied for to bring the property into compliance or the building into compliance, um, considering that it's already been inspected by federal inspectors for foreign worker occupation um, occupancy, uh, then would uh, is it feasible or possible or allowable for that to be used for foreign worker occupation? Uh, if the uh, if the application for a permit has been applied for, Director Mr. Petrie. Um, so, not until we can issue an occupancy permit, which would mean that everything would be verified to be in compliance with the building code. So, we would not permit occupancy until we can actually yeah. say that it's safe for occupancy. They'd need to start with the building permit, and then get to the all those stuff that needs to be inspected. Um, whether that's done through our inspection or an engineer, that's on there. Any other questions, Director Gettens? And then I got Director Knodel. Go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a pattern here when you just look at the work that our bylaw team has done. I mean, there's a stop work letter in January 2021, then five months later, it kept getting built on, and another stop letter, stop work letter, ensued a final notice like it's like there's it's a, it seems a little bit disrespectful of the process that we're trying to put in place and that we hold other people accountable for and I and I hear the struggle for the vineyard and nobody wants to see anybody not get their foreign workers and I don't know what happens with foreign workers who are on their way here in a week and I don't know if that means they're now cancelled and I think that's a huge impact on these people that were hoping to come here but I feel like we have to kind of stand by our bylaws officers here they've given fair notice over and over and over and i think this is this is a problem so i'm willing to keep hearing and keep an open mind about this but i think i think we're setting a precedence here so that's just a comment that i have to say yeah. director canodal i'm not seeing it you know usually when a, a something in my area goes like this i, I have some contact uh, prior to the meetings, this one I'm totally in the blind with, just with the last one. Uh, but I don't believe there's been any uh, uh, acceptance from the ELC for foreign worker accommodation either, which is another step in the process. So um, it, it's just a, a little confusing that now we're here. Now what, uh, you know, you tear these buildings down and, and then throw in a temporary? Is is that going to be the outcome? Um, here, terribly conflicted with these. Uh, as I say, no background prior to the meeting from the, the clients, so I'm kind of stuck. I'm going to have to go with the administrative recommendation. 
Okay. Any further discussion on this? Don't want to miss anybody's hands. Director Conans, go ahead. I hadn't heard um, from the applicant or from the, uh, I haven't heard that they were in the process of complying, like walking over there and applying for a permit or anything. I understand maybe the situation that um, you're in. I, maybe it's too late to ask, but it, what what do you plan? Is it too late to ask, uh, Chair? Uh, what do you? I, I I can understand the situation you're in with the workers coming in, but what is it you plan to do right now about this situation? I mean, our plan is like, to walk over there right now and. Yeah. 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 I would just point out that we are giving them till July 15th. There is a grace period before injunctive action starts, but they substantially need to do something yeah. versus not. Uh, yeah, go ahead, just, Director. Just Gettins. for clarity, in June the owner said she was going to start the application, and then in December there was no further contact. So. This is where we are. Yeah. <laughs> like they've had lots of fair notices. So you got to July, so get going. Yeah. Any further discussion on this? We do have the motion on the floor. Everybody's aware of it. It is a corporate vote. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to item C1, development variance permit for area I, CAO. Yeah, this is an application uh, for three variances, Mr. Chair. And I, I did have a, a note from the agent for the uh, owner of this property uh, challenging the way that the recommendation was uh, made it, it makes it almost seem like we the variance was for the, the addition of campsites that's not the case mr chair this is uh the three property related um variances under the campground regulation so just to clarify that so the variance application is to vary the maximum distance between the on-site washroom uh, facilities and the camping spaces and there's a variance required uh that the washroom facilities be standalone. They're, they're uh, applying to put them on the same, uh, on, on the golf course uh, uh, main building. And then there is the variance request uh, to vary the distance uh, required between a secondary access and a primary access, uh, which is our main concern, uh, Mr. Chair, in that um, the the, the two accesses right now converge before they get to the campground. So in our mind, that is a single access uh, to the campground, uh, which is non-compliant with the bylaw. And our interest there is that with a single uh, access egress, if there is uh, some sort of an accident in that one um, access egress, that it is a safety issue and that it could bottleneck stop the emergency vehicles from uh, getting into the campground or people getting out if it's a conflagration. Uh, so we are recommending that the, app, uh, that the application uh, for the DBP be denied, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you for that. And I'll go to Director Monteith on this one. Go ahead, please. Thank you. And to the Chair, I'd like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, so you're moving it to de be denied. Is there a seconder for that? It's on the floor. Generally, when we allow a denial or have a denial on the floor, we ask the applicant or their agent if they are available to speak to it. And I'm getting the nod that they are. So if the applicant or agent is available, please go ahead. Who is that in this case? Is that Mr. Alenko? Okay. I think Danny's moving him into where he can speak. Are you with us, Mr. Alenko? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, if I can share a screen, um, Mr. Francisco, would that be possible? I think you're able to do that. I'm probably able to do that. I just have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 
Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that there is a, an image on the screen there. Not yet. Word. Oh, it says you're starting to share content here now. Yes, you have an image up. Okay. Great. We just Thank got to get a little bigger and we'll be good to go. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, board members. Um, uh, thank you, um, uh, CAO, for just clarifying that, uh, that wording. It was kind of important. I wanted to ensure that the board um, was not under the impression that we were looking for a variance to density. That's not the case. So thank you for clarifying that. Uh, as the CAO mentioned, there's three variances uh, being requested. The variances are to the campground bylaw, the campground regulations bylaw. Uh, two of the variances uh, staff has supported. Um, the one variance they supported was the distance, the maximum distance from a camp stall uh, to a washroom. And the other variance that was supported was allowing the washroom building to be contained within the administrative building. So I, I thank staff for uh, um, uh, supporting that. Uh, the item that's in question is the, as uh, the, the CAO mentioned, was the, uh, the second access to the site. So I'm just gonna um, concentrate my comments to, uh, to that particular aspect. In terms of emergency egress, um, staff stated that it's to protect the public safety by ensuring campgrounds can be evacuated quickly in the case of emergency. Uh, the existing and proposed campground provides two accesses to Twin Lakes Road and does provide an emergency egress out of the campground through the south end of the campground, um, which provides access to Twin Lakes Road um, pardon me, to Range Road. Uh, they indicated that the purpose of the access uh, was to provide emergency evacuation. Um, the existing egress out to the south of the campground will provide exactly that. Uh, the emergency egress protects the public safety by ensuring the campground can be evacuated quickly in the case of an emergency. And if I might, uh, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, the area in the yellow is the existing campground. Uh, the area in the blue is where they would like to uh, expand the campground into. And in terms of the emergency access, uh, this is a sort of a site plan of, of what's being proposed. And this site plan does show the emergency access coming down. There is an existing uh, developed, um, I wouldn't call it a road. It's, it's not a public road. It's not a paved road, but it's a, it's a well-used road through this area and it does provide access to Range Road, and that would come through and out to Range Road. So it's not paved. Uh, it probably does not meet a road standard, but from a secondary access, from an emergency access perspective, uh, fire and emergency, uh, people need to evacuate quickly. That is a very effective uh, method out, and it's currently used. So although it doesn't provide access uh, you know, through a formalized uh, a road out to uh, Twin Lakes Road or to a road, uh, it certainly does, I think, meet the spirit of what the bylaw intention was, and that was to allow emergency access. And just for the um, edification of the board members, the two accesses that are currently there are uh, on Twin Lakes Road, where my hand is showing here, and the other one is here. In terms of the bottleneck, staff indicated uh, a concern with the bottleneck at the entrance to the campground. Uh, where that concern is, is presumably uh, right in this area here. And the, the concern would be that you have an access in here and you have an access from here and they both converge. So I, I, can't, I can't dispute the fact that that's, um, you know, that's a concern of theirs. I can state that the owner has indicated that they are prepared to widen this out. Uh, you know, during the renovation of the campground, they can do some widening through this area to essentially provide two roads. Uh, so in the event that there is, you know, an occurrence somewhere that, that this does bottleneck, we can effectively provide two accesses side by side uh, coming out through there if, if that's deemed, deemed appropriate. So we can certainly provide that. Uh, we wanted to just uh, uh, shift gears just a little bit and talk about other campgrounds in the RDOS. We looked at other campgrounds in the RDOS and uh, campgrounds that had 50 campsites. And we found that only one contained two accesses to a public road that were greater than 50 meters apart. That's all we could find. 
Uh, all the other campgrounds in the RDUS that contained greater than 50 campsites did not comply with the two access requirement 50 meters apart. And notably, uh, uh, the two non-compliant campgrounds uh, that you know stuck out to us were the two provincial campgrounds on Highway 97, just north of Summerland. The Okanagan Lake Provincial Park North and Okanagan Lake Provincial Park South each have 20 campsites and each of them only have one access. And these campgrounds are in an area that's much more prone uh, to emergency, such as wildfire, uh, that would require evacuation. So we just wanted to indicate that we're not doing anything here that is um, sort of out of the norm. In fact, what we're doing is, is probably better than the norm because we are providing uh, a rough access out. In terms of uh, low wildfire hazard risk, uh, the campground of Twin Lakes is nestled in a golf course. Um, the, the possibility of a wildfire coming through in this area is probably be very, very slim. In fact, one might argue that the golf course might be a refuge for people in the event of a wildfire. Um, so, you know, the, the wildfire and the incidents of, a, of an occurrence like that are probably pretty slim. Uh, it's not possible uh, for, this, for this project to provide a second access. Um, the access, uh, you know, from, from the campground is at this point here, this area slopes up and there's some you know, future development plans in here. And other than that, the rest, of the, the rest of the property is surrounded by golf course. So there really isn't another opportunity to provide an access, especially considering the location. If this campsite was somehow spread out adjacent to the site here, that might be possible. But the, the historic development of the site where it is just doesn't allow that to happen. Um, another point that we'd like to make is that emergency access or egress is not required for multifamily development. This, the zoning of this site actually allows uh, townhomes and it allows up to 65 townhomes per hectare. And this is a little over two hectare sites. So technically you could have 130 townhomes. I'm not sure if you get that many in there, but let's just say over 50. If they were to develop over 50 townhomes in this area, they would not be required to have a second access. But there is a requirement for a second access to have more than 50 campsites. So it, it, it's peculiar that it would suggest that the safety of full-time residents are not as important as the safety as temporary campers. Um, the need to expand the, camp, the campground beyond 50 sites. The project is existing right now. It has old infrastructure and the owner is to improve the infrastructure on the site. In order to do that, they need to have more than 50 campsites to make this viable. It's a costly venture to upgrade and, and uh, upgrade everything. And um, limiting it to 50 campsites, uh, it, it's just not going to work. So then they end up having to leave it the way it is and you know, sort of slowly deteriorate, I guess. So they need that. That's sort of the, the reason for expanding. They're, one of the big reasons to expand is that it's going to provide a little extra revenue to help offset the costs to provide a better park. And the last item I'd like to just um, mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, is the way that the application was submitted. It's one development variance permit with three components in it. And Mr. Chair, if I could request that if the board uh, desires or so chooses to not accept one of the variances, that the, that the DVP be allowed to be uh, approved with the other two variances. Uh, we're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater if we throw all three of them out. So it's a request that I'd like to make because the way it's sort of structured right now, um, the, the, if, if uh, one of the items is not supportable by the board, uh, the whole application is going to go down. And so I'd, I'd like to make that request and I'll just leave that uh, up to you to make that decision with the board. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that the board members may have. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I'll go to the board. Is there any questions for Mr. Elenko on this specific application? Yeah, I can see the folks online as far as if I'm seeing their hands or not, but I'm not seeing any questions from the board. It means you did a thorough job on your presentation, Brad. We appreciate that. I'll go back to the board now then uh, for further discussion on this. Director Monteith, go ahead. And to the chair, I guess I have a question about the campground, um, the bylaw. So 
Is it true that by adding more than 50 campsites that that's why they are required to have the second um, access point? Is that correct? Okay. Uh, is that a change to the bylaw? Is, there, is that something new? Is that So uh, how is it that other campgrounds have that? Mr. Garish, go ahead. So my understanding is the campground bylaw dates to, well, the original version of it dates to 1982. And um, in that time, to the extent that we've issued permits, it's generally been for existing campgrounds doing expansions. All the other campgrounds are pre-existing, uh, established before that requirement came into effect. Okay, Director Monteith. Thank you. So I do have a follow-up, not to staff, but to the board. Um, so to follow up on the presentation, as well as staff, I do agree with uh, two of the variances. So um, moving the bathroom to the clubhouse makes sense. That totally makes sense. I totally get that. Um, moving the distance from the RV sites to the bathroom also makes sense. They're RVs, so they typically have bathrooms and they may be using the shower at the clubhouse, but not necessarily, um, you know, always. Um, I guess my concern is exactly what staff brought forward would be the second uh, egress being that close. And being that this is a change and now they're looking at an expansion, this is the opportunity to do things right. So I do support making sure that we do follow the public safety and make sure that we're getting, you know, infrastructure incorrect. The community also expressed that, that if we're going to um, put more of a stress on the road that we, you know, consider not only the campers, but also the community as well. So... I'm going to make a suggestion or a motion um, that we defer this application to perhaps give the applicant an opportunity to revisit their variances and see if they want to put both four or all three forward or only two. Um, and at that point, maybe we can make a decision. Okay, so we do have the motion to deny on the floor. So you're moving to defer? Yeah, to the next board meeting. Okay, is there a seconder for that? It's seconded on the floor. Generally not a need for discussion on that. That would make it, it was a rural vote, if I'm not mistaken, this makes it corporate when we go to defer, um, just for clarity. Yes, to defer a matter at the board table would be a corporate vote. Okay, so corporate vote on the motion to defer. All those in favor, thank you. Any opposed, motion carries. All right, next, down to C3, because we took C2 off. Uh, official Community Plan and Zoning Amendment in Electoral Area A, CAO. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is an application for a, uh, an OCP amendment and a zoning amendment, and it is for a property uh, on Anarchist Mountain. Uh, was previously the... the uh, uh, show home for the Regal Ridge development and uh, is now no longer a show home, it's a residence and they're looking for uh, the amendment enabled to, uh, to enable them to formalize the existing use. So we're recommending that this be given uh, first and second reading, Mr. Chair, and that the public hearing be scheduled before the board on February 16th. Okay, would somebody be willing to move that motion for me? Moved, thank you. A seconder? Great. Any discussion needed on this? Seeing no hands, this one is a rural vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. That takes us over to C4, the CAO Delegation Bylaw and Development Procedures Bylaw Amendments, CAO. Yeah, this is a follow-up on that discussion we had about uh, cannabis license application process, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is really about uh, streamlining the process uh, for those applications, and we're rec recommending that this be given uh, first, second, and third reading, and that we also give the uh, development procedures by law for second and third reading. Okay, so that's two separate motions. Looking for direction from the board on this. You're moving it? Moving the first one. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you. Any discussion needed? Seeing no hands, we'll call the question. These are corporate. The first one is, anyway. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. 
The second part of that is a rural vote. Looking for a mover on that. Moved, seconded, thank you. Any discussion? Don't think I'm missing any hands. Call the question. All in favor? Great. Any opposed? Motion carries. Over to C5, Zoning Amendment in Area C, CAO. This is the mobile home on a parcel less than four hectares, Mr. Chair, and it is back for adoption. All right. I'll go to Director Knodel. Moving the... Uh administrative recommendation okay mover seconded thank you this one is a rural vote again is there need for discussion on this just adoption seeing no question I'll, or seeing no hands i'll call the question all those in favor thank you any opposed motion carries there were no items removed, so down to legislative services. The SILGA resolutions, CAO. SILGA resolutions. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, Ms. Malden was uh, industriously taking notes this morning as to what was coming <laughs> and what was not, so I'm going to turn this over to her. Oh, throwing her under the bus. <laughs> That's Please. what happens when you're diligent. <laughs> Go so ahead. What I gathered from this morning is that some of them would be moving forward and some of them would be brought back for additional work and brought to the next meeting, which is fine. It still meets our requirements for SILGA. So just to recap quickly and make sure we've captured everything, resolution one on primary care, we were going to remove the reference to Summerland um, and send it onwards yeah. uh, to, to SILGA, um, adjusted accordingly. Resolution two. That one was okay to move forward to SILGA. Resolution three, okay to go to SILGA. And again, we'll be keeping an eye out for that. Could you just tell us which ones rather than just the number, if you could, what it was sort of about? <laughs> <laughs> Not okay. about, but what was the heading on sure. it? Sure, yes, no problem at all. So resolution three was invasive species. Okay. Uh, so we'll, that one will advance forward and we'll be keeping an eye on Squamish Lillooet as well. Um, trees. So that uh, the resolution for trees requires more work. We'll bring that back to the next meeting. Okay. Resolution five regarding BC uh, emergency health services uh, is okay to go. All right. But deployment is required to be defined a little better. Did I capture that one correctly? That's what we were okay, looking good. for. And transit, okay to go. The cannabis and liquor control, okay to go. ALC expansion, okay to go. Uh, resolution nine, the one hectare policy. That will come back to the next one, next meeting. Resolution 10, that was, I uh, have to look at what resolution 10. Hike and bike, yes, yeah. Hike and bike was withdrawn. Okay. Resolution 11 ICBC has not been introduced. It will come back at the next meeting. So, how many are we sending at this point? Just is it out of the 11, how many are going forward? Just so everybody's clear. Uh, I have seven going next. Okay. So, we're looking at meeting. those seven. Someone ready to move that we send them on to Silga? Moved, seconded, great. Any more discussion needed? Don't think I'm missing any hands. This would be a corporate vote, obviously. All those in favor? Thank you, any opposed? Motion carries. Over to D2. This is the declaration of the state of local emergency, CAO. Uh, a slight amendment on this one, Mr. Chair, compared to what's in the agenda. Uh, so this is a result um, of the, the rock slide recently in area G, just outside Karameas, and our requirement for a state of local emergency for the evacuation uh, of the one parcel. So uh, we did implement, uh, we did activate the emergency operations center and the chair did declare a state of local emergency uh, on January 16th. So we do need that one. 
that we ratify the uh, declaration of the state of local emergency. Um, and then we do need on January 16th, and then we do need the, the uh, recommendation that we uh, extend it for a further seven days. Uh, that should be January and not February. Uh, and then we do need a, a motion to cancel the uh, state of local emergency as of January 27th, uh, which is when we allowed residents back in uh, to that property. And then uh, the standby that we send the declarations to the Minister of State for emergency preparedness, which is what the Act requires. Okay, and we can do all those in one big motion if someone's ready to move that. Moved. Seconder for that. Thank you. Any discussion needed? Not seeing any hands. Again, this is a corporate vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. There was one item that came off the consent agenda that we put into the D3 slot, and that was to do with the APCs. Uh, CAO, do you want to introduce it? And then I'll go to Director Taylor. The APCs was no yeah. Mr. Garish here, so I'll go to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this was a follow-up on our uh, uh, numerous discussions about uh, how to resolve the issue with the Advisory Planning Commissions and our uh, uh, staff turnover and staff retention and uh, uh, amount of overtime being worked by the planners. So uh, following that discussion, there was a suggestion as to a schedule for electoral area uh, Advisory Planning Commissions. Uh, and it was a mixture of electronic, uh, hybrid, or in-person, uh, depending on what the electoral area director preferred. So uh, we did float a schedule on that, uh, Mr. Chair, so we've got that on the board. And then uh, there were two electoral areas that uh, submitted uh, names for their advisory planning commissions, and this was the appointment. Uh, for Area C and Area F. And uh, that is what the resolution on the consent agenda was, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'm going to go first to Mr. Taylor, as he had was the one that requested it come off. I think he just wants to change a date or something. So go ahead. Uh, of the three um, recommendations, I'd move the first one amended such that uh, Area D also meets on the second Monday monthly. Second Monday, and were you looking for a daytime or evening? Daytime. A daytime, daytime meeting? Okay, daytime, just second monthly. Second all right. Monday. Is there a seconder for that? This is to move the whole thing plus changing the meeting date for Area D. Okay, it's on the floor. Is there any further, Director Monteith? Uh, to the chair, my APC also submitted all their names as well, so I don't know why mine hasn't been appointed. It may, depending on when they came in, it may not have made it in time to make it on this one. It will, there'll be others that we approve in the future, probably the next meeting. Um, I see him shaking his head. That's why it was yeah, there. Yeah, hopefully so. they all start rolling in, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, it's it would, been a delayed process, but yeah, we'd like yeah, to get them up and running. We'd rather them all at once than individually. It just saves time for everybody. So seeing no more discussion on this one. Again, this one going to have to be a corporate vote is that not correct okay corporate vote all those in favor thank you any opposed motion carries and then we need in camera from this morning's corporate services meeting and that is in relation to staff so the rationale for going in camera if you could just Show that out to us, please, CEO, and then we'll look for a motion to go in. I can't remember it off the top of my head, so. Yeah, we're using uh, section 90, sub 1, sub C, Mr. Chair. Okay, so looking for a motion to go in camera. Moved, seconded, thank you. All those in favor? Great. Any opposed? Motion carries. Give Danny a second to do what is required. 
as to whether this is actually required or not. Uh, and it is still in different, uh, uh, different positions with different municipalities. And there are side agreements. Uh, Summerland Penticton has a fire mutual aid agreement. Uh, Princeton, Tulanine, Eras, Hayes Creek have a separate fire services mutual aid agreement. Um, so, uh, and nobody had possession of it. So uh, I'm not sure where this is going, but I know there was a question um, previously about where this is. I, I think Asoyas may be willing to take the lead on it, but uh, I'm not uh, sure if uh, they're going to follow through on that, uh, Mr. Chair. But we did discuss it. Uh, the other thing we discussed with uh, mutual aid was during the pandemic, there was a requirement uh, under the public health order for regional districts to have essential services agreements with their member municipalities. Uh, so we did. And uh, the only time we activated ours was to provide assistance to Asoyas with their uh, landfill uh, when their staff was all off sick. Um, but there was discussion as to whether it would be beneficial to um, draft a uh, post-COVID essential services agreement. And uh, we decided that that wasn't required. We would just help each other out uh, when it was uh, uh, necessary to do so. And, and we do that anyway. Um, and there's no, there's no uh, geographic areas that, uh, like a fire department, is supposed to remain within a geographic area in their service establishment bylaw. Uh, no such uh, restriction. Uh, for other essential services like uh, waste, water, or sewage. Um, we talked about the code of conduct uh, workshop that we had with Reese Harding, and uh, we decided that we would all appoint our uh, uh, corporate officers or legislative services managers uh, to form a working group uh, to talk about that interest in consistency uh, within the regional district. So uh, that is underway. Um, there, was an, there was an interest from the group uh, when we were talking about uh, sort of the orientation program that we've been doing with uh, the board of directors and elected officials from throughout the region as to what other topics might be of interest. And Indigenous relations uh, came up. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Malden's going to uh, do some research on that uh, to see if there are some appropriate speakers that we could bring in. And uh, really, I think what the interest was to try and get some sort of a consistent approach uh, for the uh, uh, regional district and incorporated communities with our uh, four bands that are in the regional district and some of the issues that are starting to arise uh, so that we can be consistent in that as well. So uh, we'll pursue that. Uh, we did talk about the collective agreement, and uh, uh, Mr. Stack gave us an update on how Summerland did, uh, which looks very good. And uh, the others are going to be starting negotiations. So he did give us a, uh, uh, an embargo draft, I think, of uh, his bargaining notes <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, we're going to take into account other than uh, Karameas, which expires at the end of 2024. So uh, that will uh, proceed. Um, we talked about uh, the cost, the uh, exponentially increasing cost of chemicals for water treatment facilities. Uh, nowadays and whether there would be some benefit in uh, joint purchasing. So we've asked uh, Penticton to, uh, uh, since they would be the largest uh, um, single purchaser, as to whether they might take the lead on that to see if there is uh, some benefit or way to do that. So we'll report later on that. Um, we talked about the fire smart, uh, there were some side conversations. So there was an interest uh, from the regional district to see if uh, Penn, uh, Princeton uh, could or would be interested or if there would be a benefit in them administering the Area H uh, fire smarting program. Uh, we have a grant, I believe it's in the nature of $50,000 uh, and we currently have a contract with uh, 
uh, chief uh, string fellow uh, to manage our project over there. And he also works for the town of Princeton. Uh, so there might be some benefits there. So we'll pursue that. Talked about the uh, potential regional transit service uh, that uh, Princeton uh, manages right now with BC Transit as to whether we could take that over as a regional program. Uh, and there did seem to be still interest, so we'll pursue that. And then we set up some regular meeting dates for 2023 uh, rather than calling them sporadically throughout the year. Uh, so that was our discussion last week, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Director Holmes, you have a question? Yeah, just uh, in respect to the bulk purchasing of chemicals for water treatment, um, if it, um, uh, we'll wait to hear what Penticton comes back with, I guess, but uh, if, it, if it shows that even that's not big enough bulk purchasing for, you know, for the chemical companies, I, w I wonder if there's opportunity to then um, consider something valley-wide maybe even through the OBWB, um, you, you know, to, so, so if just South Okanagan, some Okamine isn't bulk enough for those guys, maybe the whole valley might be. So just an idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. We'll see what comes back out of this. And seeing no more hands on that, moving on in the agenda is the chair's report. Uh, I kind of said we'd be coming back with some information in regards to the Area D incorporation study. Just for the board's information, we were supposed to meet yesterday on this, so there would have been a report, but one of the staff members from the province was sick, so it got delayed, and now we're Thursday, I think, meeting. Uh, so on that, the other item is nothing to report specifically, but it has to do with SILGA motions. Usually when we go to SILGA, it seems it falls to the chair to do most of these presentations. <laughs> so I'm imploring from the board or asking the board if some of these motions could be addressed or, or introduced by a few of the board members, specifically the ones that they more pertain to or came from. It might come across a little better than hearing me drone on every motion that comes up. So keep it, keep it in mind. When, it, when we get the list of what ones, I'll organize who's going to speak to them, but then I'm going to hold you to it. So <laughs> just a heads up, that's all. Uh, director's motions. Anything from director's motions? I believe Ms. Director Taylor. I'll try again. Go um, ahead. I'd like to uh, provide notice of motion that... Uh, RDOS send a letter of concern regarding the release on bail of high-risk individuals to rural areas that don't have local police detachments. Okay, so this is a notice of motion. Thank you. And that'll come forward at the next meeting. Any other notices of motion? Making sure I'm missing nobody on the screen. Seeing none, board members verbal updates. Anything to report from your communities or areas? All is quiet on the home front. Okay, that does the day. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved, seconded. Thank you all in favor. Great, no one's opposed. We are done. <laughs> Not that I recall, but you've got to ask always. <laughs> uh, it's one of those.